discuss ordinance number 70 2021 by council member kelly by departmental request an emergency ordinance to make appropriations and provide current expenses for the daily operation of all municipal departments of the city of cleveland for the fiscal year from january 1 2021 until december 31 2021 and i will continue to say that this Council meeting is being, this committee meeting is being held during the COVID-19 emergency declaration is being conducted as a virtual meeting in accordance with Ohio open meeting laws as amended by House Bill 404. Notice of this meeting was posted. This meeting will be available to the public on TV 20 and the council website. A question for another day for our attorneys is do we have to keep reading that? Um, and I'll take my answer offline. Um, Cause I, but anyhow, we'll take the answer offline. Okay, we have um, a, we are just housekeeping for directors and council members that are watching. We are a few departments behind where our schedule is. Today, we are going to be covering civil service commission and department of public health, public aging, and then going to department of building and housing. Um, how far we get with community development, economic development, and public utilities, we're going to have to play by ear, but we are behind by my estimation by about half a day. So I would say we're gonna do our best to have a thorough review of all departments, but also try to stay somewhat somewhat on time or on the, on the schedule. I would request my colleagues to be uh, mindful of ask the questions that you need asked, but uh, be mindful of time, be mindful of the 15 minute time limit. And if you need to go back on the list, I uh, you know, prefer that you, you know, have only a second shot, but have a very brief, have your questions well-crafted if you need to get back on the list. So let's, let's really try to do some good work, but let's try to be efficient and be respectful of everybody. With that, John, would you please read Civil Service Commission? Unmute yourself, John. There we go. Civil Service Commission is on page 112. Michael Spring, Secretary, salary and wages on page 113, 2020 unaudited, $444,016, 2021 budget, $571,653, total expenditures on page 114, 2020 unaudited, $896,934. 2021 budget, $1,358,473. Number of employees on page 115. Number of employees, December 2012. Number of employees budgeted for 2021-14. Thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. Secretary Thank Spring, you. how are you doing today? I'm well. I hope you are well. All is all doing well today. And good morning, uh, Mr. Council President, Safety Chair Griffin, Workforce Chair Bishop, and members of Council. I appreciate the Council President moving this session to this morning because it will give us the time we need to discuss and address a number of subjects uh, of importance to all of us. The Office of the Civil Service Commission has several areas of responsibility, including the management of the job classification system and hearing employee appeals relating to disciplinary matters. In addition to these functions, the Civil Service Commission is responsible for administering examinations for competitive classifications and creating eligible lists for use by city departments hiring employees. Council has asked a number of questions about the testing and hiring process, so my remarks today will focus on aspects of those processes. 
The charter of the city of Cleveland requires that employees and competitive classifications be hired from eligible lists created by examination. Those lists rank candidates based on examination scores, plus any residency or veterans points for which a candidate may qualify. When a list is developed by the commission staff, it is presented to the Civil Service Commission at one of its regular meetings for approval, at which point it is considered established. When a list is established, it is in existence for a stated time before it expires, typically one to two years. The maximum period for which a list can be established is two years as provided in the charter. During the life of an eligible list, a department with an approved personal personnel requisition can request a list of candidates from civil service and we will provide candidates to that department for that particular vacancy after confirming that those candidates wish to be considered for that vacancy. That process of providing names from an eligible list for consideration is what we call certifying the list. Once candidates have been certified from the list, they undergo evaluation by the hiring department until completion of the selection and hire from the names provided. Candidates cannot be certified from a list which has expired. However, the selection and hire process may continue through its completion for candidates who were certified before a list expired, even though that list may expire in the interim. Residency preference points and veterans preference points are available to candidates who qualify for them. Materials demonstrating those point, qualification for those points must be provided by candidates during the application process because they are used to create the final ranking of candidates on that list established from the examination. To receive 10 points on an entrance, 10 residency points on an entrance examination, a candidate must provide proof of continuous residency in the city of Cleveland for the 12 months prior to their application and also receive a passing score on the examination. Military points are available to candidates who provide a DD-214 form showing an acceptable discharge status and at least six months of active duty service. Those points are added to a candidate's examination score and are considered with that score in determining whether the candidate has achieved a passing score on the examination. For a number of years, civil service has required multiple documents from candidates to establish those residency, months of residency. We've worked to ensure that candidates were made aware of the availability of those points and educated on their impact on their opportunity to be considered for hire. I will address residency points in more detail in just a moment. Over the last few years, we have worked intensively with Public Safety Administration, its various divisions, and the Public Safety Recruitment Team through a working group known as the Public Safety Hiring Committee. I chair that committee, which meets on a bi-weekly basis to discuss and address issues affecting recruitment and hiring in those divisions. In those meetings, we have systematically reviewed our recruitment, testing, and hiring practices in an effort to remove potential or perceived obstacles or barriers affecting candidates and to ensure a fair and open process for them. From those meetings, we've developed a collaborative and cooperative partnership with the safety divisions, which is starting to produce the desired results. You heard Director West touch on some of the initiatives that have come from that committee's work and the importance of addressing matters in a way to create sustainable change I, I can only stress that we are looking not for cosmetic or superficial changes, but for profound changes that yield the results we need. I wanna review a number of those activities for you today. We have implemented a process of forecasting and establishing hiring timelines for Public Safety Academy recruitment, testing and selection. Those timelines facilitate effective recruitment activities which are planned and implemented by the recruitment team. Together with Director Howard and Safety Administration, our goal is to establish a relatively fixed schedule of annual academies and test cycles that will create predictability of those cycles for the candidate pool and allow for more efficient and effective recruitment and hiring efforts. 
We've developed an approach to recruitment designed to provide information and ongoing support for candidates in the process. I should note that the efforts of the recruitment team, especially for the Division of Police, has generated applications in a quantity which runs contrary to national and state trends. In the most recent police cycle, uh, recruitment cycle, which was completed, our applicant pool was 39% white, 42% black, 10% Hispanic, and the, the rest a combination of Asian, Native American, and, and candidates uh, with two or more uh, ethnicities. Notwithstanding the social issues relating to the role and funding of police being discussed around the country, Cleveland continues to receive high volumes of applications for police, as well as for fire, for which the recruitment team deserves much credit. In fact, we receive public records requests from other Ohio cities asking for lists of our police applicants. In addition to reaching and encouraging applicants to apply, there's also a focused effort to keep those applicants in our process. As a consequence, in the most recent police cycle, we had the lowest rate of candidate rejections for missing documentation and the lowest rate of candidates failing to complete the process that we've had in the last five years. That result is a that results in a stronger list of tested candidates and maximizes the benefits of the recruitment activity. As this council may recall in prior hearings, I've described the loss of candidates at steps in the application and testing processes and the effect that has on our hiring cycles. Our continued efforts on this issue should have positive results in the next fire cycle as well as other test cycles moving forward. On the issue of residency credit, the hiring committee has worked to address how to ensure more candidates receive the credit to which they're entitled. Residency credit materials have been created and made part of the information distributed by the recruitment team and the availability of those points has been a point of emphasis in recruitment activities and presentations for the last few years. Most recently though, in an effort to streamline the process to obtain those points and make it easier for our residents to obtain them, civil service has developed an affidavit form which applicants can complete and deliver to obtain those points. That form is currently being finalized and has not yet been placed in use, although our goal is to implement it for upcoming public safety testing cycles. When it's finalized, of course, we will provide a copy of it to members of council. This council's continued support in assisting residents in submitting that form will be appreciated. When it's put into use, the city's application for examination will also include a question asking candidates if they've lived in the city for at least 12 months and direct them to complete that affidavit if they indicate they meet that requirement. This is just one of the many efforts we undergo to ensure that our residents have the opportunities they deserve. In addition, we've worked with HR and IT to acquire and integrate a text messaging feature, notification feature into our NeoGov application system that will provide another communication channel to remind candidates of important deadlines and items that they need to deliver. That feature was added in January of this year and will be used for examination cycles going forward. Again, this supports our efforts to keep and support applicants in the process. We've added a behavioral based interviewing process step into the evaluation of public safety candidates to provide an additional step to obtain a more comprehensive picture of a candidate to inform the selection process. You heard Director Howard speak of using a holistic approach to evaluate and select candidates for appointment to public safety academies, and this is one aspect of that approach. Civil service testing is designed to support merit-based hiring decisions as a starting point in the process, but a test score is only one aspect of a candidate's qualifications and suitability for a position. We continue to work with public safety and human resources to evaluate potential career pipelines and clearer career pathways for many positions within public safety, not only 
EMS, police, and fire, but also positions within dispatch and communications. Our hope is that these efforts will generate more career options for our residents and result in sustainable pipelines of candidates. With public safety, we're also engaging with the Ohio Means Jobs Workforce Office to leverage their involvement with the Student Workforce Advancement Group of the CMSD Career Pathways team to develop programs and messaging for our career opportunities. Again, as we look to make ensuring enduring sustainable changes in, in process, these are efforts of great significance. While not purely a civil service function, it's a collaborative effort across departments and is an extension of this administration's efforts to address economic disparities in our community and ensure access to career opportunities of significance for our residents. In terms of hiring in the division of fire, we've recently implemented a new physical ability test or PAT for fire candidates. This new test known as the firefighter mile is a nationally recognized test and has been specifically validated as an evaluation tool for use by our division of fire. One of the significant keys to our implementation of that new PAT was to provide an extended period of for candidates to practice the test and receive instruction on the proper techniques for successful completion of the tasks within the test. I will note that members of the Division of Fire and the Fire Academy staff were eagle, eager and essential participants in those practice and prep sessions. In addition, for the first time, we required candidates to attend a minimum of two practice sessions before they were allowed to take the actual test. This requirement was implemented because in prior test cycles, many candidates chose not to attend the provided voluntary practice sessions, which we believe resulted in a higher failure rate on the PAT. As a result of these efforts, I'm pleased to tell you that only two candidates failed the firefighter mile PAT, which was completed in January this year, as compared to failure rates in prior years, as high as 15 to 20%. While that may seem a small thing, it is a monumental difference, which is representative of our efforts to find creative and progressive approaches to our testing and hiring processes. This change in process has helped to produce a pool of candidates for selections for a fire academy, which may yield the most diverse fire academy in recent years. The point of providing you with all these explanations of examples is that we are creating a deliberate and collaborative approach to recruit and support our candidates through our entire process, position them for success and provide them with an environment in which they can maximize their opportunities. In these ways, we are working to create lasting and sustainable changes to our testing and hiring practices. I welcome any ideas from and conversations with members of council on any of these issues. In this moment, our current diversity numbers compared to last year do not show significant change. Simply stated, limited hiring over the last year has meant limited change in the demographic composition of our workforce. As we move into 2021 with increased hiring plans for public safety, I anticipate that we will all see the continuing benefits of these and other efforts to affect improvements and permanent change in our workforce. I stress that while I see positive results from these efforts, our work in these areas is not done. We will continue to respond to the challenges of hiring for these positions using a deliberate and intentional effort to make opportunities not only available, but easily accessible by our residents. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my remarks. I welcome any questions your members may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Spring. Um, I made a slight error. I'd like to apologize. I need to revert for just a second. Um, I want everybody on the call to just take a moment of silence. We lost uh, Cecilia Huffman uh, last night. I just want to take a moment before we proceed to reflect, and then I want to get back to the business that we're doing. So if we could take a moment of silence to uh, remember Cecilia Huffman. Thank you. And I intended to do that early. I just blanked. So I apologize about 
um, going slightly out of order. But um, thank you for the presentation, Secretary Spring. Um, the, I reviewed the budget book before, um, last night before we started, and everything that you, that you just, just presented is in line. The one question that I had is, let me open this tab. Uh, sorry about this. Let it go. Too many tabs open. Okay, on the um, the contractual services or professional services, there was a um, a significant drop. What are what are those services that you use? The professional service on page one thirteen, mm -hmm. um, going from seven hundred forty one thousand in nineteen to. 183 and then kind of evening out for 2021 and 350. What is what is the professional service that you use most of? Well, uh, those services uh, to the chair and, and council, uh, those services primarily are third party testing vendors. Um, and we have worked over the last few years to try and level off those costs. What you see in the 2019 numbers represents uh, the cost of some of our police and fire promotional test cycles, which are the most expensive things that we do. Um, and our numbers last year, the actual numbers, of course, reflect that in the COVID environment, we were not doing as much testing and hiring. Uh, I anticipate uh, that going forward, in general, uh, we've tried to level those costs off at, at you know, three to four hundred thousand dollars a year. But, but again, those services are uh, principally uh, testing services uh, through one and a variety of vendors. Okay, thank you. And uh, that's that's the only kind of numbers question that I had. Looking at um, or just reflecting on the testimony that we had from Director Nicole West and Director Howard, I I believe that. And having worked with you, I believe that you know we are not where we need to be, but everybody is uh, is working towards the same goal of of creating a diverse workforce. And again, I, I appreciate the fact that you said that these aren't numbers or boxes to check, um, but this is a true commitment. And it seems like the the class that you're getting are driving towards that. Um, I will say myself, as the um, secretary knows, I worked with. Um, Secretary Spring on a residency issue for somebody in Ward 13. And without divulging any names or results, I can tell you that they worked very hard to make sure that this individual had the appropriate points on, on the application. And, you know, oftentimes, which was the case in the one that we were dealing with, um, all the fault didn't lie with us as the, the, the applicant needed to do a few things. But I will say that I just want to make the point that in terms of the path forward and the trends, I do believe that there is there's commitment to making sure that we we reach our diversity goals, and that if you have an issue, um, Secretary Spring has been very responsive, and then the commission's very responsive about making sure that people get the credit that they are entitled to. So I appreciate that. I'm anticipating we're gonna you know we we'll go over a lot of these things during in this morning's hearing, but again, I would like to begin with my colleagues. And I'm going to ask all my colleagues to um, keep a, their own clock. I'll keep mine. But if we can keep to about 15 minutes, I would appreciate it. Ward 8 Councilman Mike Blunzik. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. My honorable colleagues, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. I, too, want to um, thank um, uh, Secretary Sprague, because every time I have made an inquiry to him, um, he's always been responsive and he's gotten back to me. Um, and I certainly appreciate that. Um, it's important that when a council member makes an inquiry, whether it be the civil service or any other department or division, there'd be a proper response. So again, thank you. Um, I asked yesterday, uh, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Sprague, uh, during when uh, Nicole West was up from Human Resources, uh, as pertains to um, making a request as it pertains to a specific class or test as it pertains to the ranking of individuals. Um, and she indicated that she could not provide that it. it would have to be up to civil service. So as it pertains to any test that was held by the city for a civil service position, 
those those lists are available to view. Are they? Uh, th through the chair to the councilman, uh, absolutely. In fact, the, our charter ex specifically provides that eligible lists are to be made available to the public. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, uh, with what I'll call internal requests, we freely provide copies of lists when they come from outside uh, the city. Of course, we still freely provide them, but we ask people to go through the public records portal just for tracking purposes. But internally, we don't require that. Now on those lists, it will show uh, the scores and ranks of candidates. It'll show certification activity. Uh, and we also try to make, stay current in noting on those lists, hires which have been made from certifications. Sometimes we don't get uh, immediate notification of higher selections by departments. Uh, so it's we can always confirm those as Director West indicated through our HRIS system ADP. Okay. Uh, but but yes, if any list that you want to see, you are freely welcome to have them, sir. Okay. So on that note, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will I will make a request, an internal request um, to the secretary to be able to view a specific list of, of uh, potential employees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will make that request. Thank you, Councilman Plenzik. Councilman Charles Slight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How's my microphone today? Excellent. Uh, we're doing great. So um, radio. I, I just have a couple questions and then I probably have to pop over to Planning Commission. Uh, so I will try to keep it brief, uh, but thank you and thank you to uh, the commissioner for being before us today. Uh, if you weren't, if you didn't have the chance to listen the other day, I, I noted that so many of our questions, especially related to public safety, but not exclusively to public safety, uh, really do center around civil service. And, uh, you know, so many of uh, the members of city council ask questions about diversity in the hiring process. And, and as I see it, civil service really is the gatekeepers for that entire process. If civil, well, we have to have a strong functioning civil service in order to achieve that end goal. And it's an important end goal. There's so many values to diversity, but just fundamentally, we are a diverse city and our workforce should reflect that. And, and you know, I, brief nerd moment, but you know, civil service was created, civil service systems to allow for equitable access to government jobs. So that, 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 that's the fundamental goal with, in and of itself. So um, I, want, I want to go back and use our conversation we had with the Division of Fire just as, as our example, so I can understand um, a couple of things. The first, and you touched on this, uh, uh, Mr. Sprang, in your comments, on, on the certification of the list. I, I want to make sure, the, the question that I asked, the director of public safety when he had said that the current fire list expired in October of 2020. My question was, how are we able then to hire from that list in 2021? And his, um, his response, I believe, was that the list was certified in September prior to expiration and that allowed it to be valid. Is that, is that correct? Uh, through the chair to the councilman, that, that is uh, absolutely correct. And, and uh, I will also claim a, a nerd moment. Uh, one of your uh, former colleagues, uh, uh, councilman, now, now it's uh, utility director, Martin Keene, uh, once told me I may be the only person who understands civil service. But uh, to, to your point, sir, um, as I indicated, uh, once certified candidates are allowed to remain in the process until uh, that process has been completed, even if the list expires in the interim. Um, the fire list did expire in October of 2020. Uh, however, we had certified candidates prior to its expiration for processing and it, it ended up, we didn't complete all of the PAT processing until January of this year, but they were properly certified and are properly in process for hire and consideration by the division. Uh, do you recall through the chair the date of that certification? Um, I, I, to the chair, uh, to the councilman, I, I don't. I can provide that to you. I will tell you that um, based on there, were, I believe there were a couple of certification steps that we performed because. Uh, in part due to uh, perhaps the age of the list. Um, 
when we did the initial certification at the request of the division, uh, the response rate didn't give us what, what we felt was a large enough pool of candidates for processing. And so we, we did an additional certification. So I, there are multiple dates, but I can certainly provide those to you. If, if you could please provide that information through Antilly, uh, I think that's important. I have on my screen right now, uh, the notice for that fire examination from 2017. And on page five or six, under life of eligibility, life of the eligibility list, it, it says the life of the eligibility list from this examination will not exceed one year from the date the list is established. Um, so I, we heard from the Division of Fire an intent to hire 80 men and women mm -hmm. off of a remaining list of 159. I want that to occur. Uh, but I, I'm confused in reading this. It seems that pieces aren't lining up. So if, if I just don't understand the process through this, so be it. But at the outsider reading this might be scratching their head wondering what's going on here. Well, uh, if I may, uh, through the chair to the councilman, I, I appreciate that specific point. And, and just to put that concern to, to rest, at the time that we announced that test, uh, it was announced and the timing of the announcement was based on what we anticipated the hiring needs and hiring cycle for the Division of Fire was going to be. Between the time that we announced the test and were preparing to establish the list, uh, it became apparent that that time was not, that timeline was going to change. So initially, yes, that in the test bulletin, and you are as announced, you are correct. Uh, it was announced as a, one year list. However, at the time that the list was presented to the commission, we addressed that issue and it was established for a two year period. So, so that is how that inconsistency you see uh, was addressed by the commission at the time the list was established. And it was established with a stated expiration date and a published expiration date of 2020. On that point, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilman Slife, will you yield for a very brief point? That's yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the thank you to my colleague, uh, Mr. Slife. Um, the question I have is specific. Uh, how many minorities make up that list? Thank you, Secretary Sprague, and then back to Charles Slife. Uh, if you'll give me a moment, I believe I have that. If I don't, I can readily provide it to you. I will tell you that uh, this, this list uh, to the chair of the councilman uh, when was one I used as an example of in prior conversations of losing people in the process that we've taken steps to address uh, because the diversity of the applicant pool did not carry through as completely to those that are on the list because candidates did not complete the process. But I'll, I, what I have in front of me indicates that uh, the composition of the list was um, approximately 1% Asian candidates, 13.2% black, 8.6% white, um, a few under, undisclosed candidates and 72% white. Thank you. Carol, Councilman Slife. Uh, thank you. Um, going going back to this specific example, and and I, I do not believe you were on in the head of the Civil Service Commission when this was released, but I want to use it as an example of how we need to be more strategic, uh, because this is a point that's come up a number of times from a number of my colleagues. For this specific um, public notice it was released in March of 2017, and the closing date was April of 2017. And if you scroll down to basic requirements, the basic requirement is that you're 18 years old and you have a high school diploma. Um, maybe things have changed, uh, but I've never heard of a high school senior getting a diploma uh, by mid middle of April. Um, so we've talked a lot about uh, you know, how do we reach young people? How do we make the burden of proving residency easier? How do we come up with educational programs to bring them through the process? 
if all of those things were perfectly in place at the time of this announcement, you would have had men and women who missed eligibility by about one month because they hadn't yet graduated from high school. And I use that example, I, I've said repeatedly that I worry I that things that we are doing on our end could be undercutting our efforts to reach a, a larger, more important goal. And to me, that is just a red flag of all red flags that, 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 that hadn't been fully thought through. Um, so my request would be, as we're moving forward, um, to be a, uh, ensure that we are taking time and analyzing ourselves critically to make sure that as we are releasing information, dates, they're lining up with all of the things we're doing external to civil service to try to bring people in. Um, I know that's not necessarily a budgetary ask, but I think it's a very important policy ask. Well, if I may, uh, through the chair to the councilman, uh, I appreciate that comment. And I will tell you that with respect to the 2017 test, uh, I, I am aware of the response to that. I also need to, to address one, one housekeeping item uh, Councilman, there was a 2017 test, which is the one you are referring to. The one which created the current civil service list was a 2018 okay. test announcement. So you may be looking at the wrong test bulletin. It was civil service announcement 2018-067. And the application period for that examination was in July of 2018. Uh, and my comments relative to the life of the list uh, are, relate to that test announcement, not the 2017 test announcement. But returning to your point, uh, one of the things that we have discussed and will address in our future fire examinations, because I understand your point quite well and our desire is not to exclude those who may very soon become eligible with a high school diploma uh, Ohio law allows us to accept applicants who are 17 and a half who have not yet graduated. Uh, and we will look to address that available option in our prior, in our future announcements with the understanding that before, of course, anyone can actually be hired, they must have completed high school and, and provided proof of that graduation. So, to your point, uh, I appreciate it, and I believe that we will satisfactorily address it going forward. Thank you. Um, through through the chair um, to the uh, uh, the secretary, two more items. Um, one uh, that I had brought up with public safety is my concern about national testing, and um, uh, to, to to summarize it quickly, uh, as we are trying to create jobs for men and women locally, are we simultaneously putting them in a more competitive pool and, and undercutting that effort? Do we have data on, obviously we, were, we, we pull in zip codes and addresses, we use that to, uh, you know, as part of the residency thing. Do we have data on where applicants are applying from? Uh, to, through the chair to the councilman, uh, we do, but I, I wanna put, address your concerns specifically, but I also want to put it in a little bit of perspective. One, we have always uh, used a third party vendor to help us develop and administer police and fire entrance examinations as a way to ensure that we have both a current best practices and valid evaluation tool for our candidates. So the fact that we now use the National Testing Network uh, is, is not a new concept. Now, uh, in addition, in prior cycles, when we used other vendors and used a paper application process, administered a single day test, we had people that would come from five or six states to Cleveland to take our test, Pennsylvania, New York, Michigan, uh, Kentucky, uh, as examples. So again, we've always had a small percentage of out-of-state applicants, but the thing that I, I will stress to you about the NTN process is they are just a test vendor. They do not do our recruitment. We do our recruitment. Candidates come first to us and apply on our website, and they are then referred to the NTN website to schedule their test session. So, so they are not, while it's possible that people may see things on their website and come to us, for the most part, our applicant pool is based on our city of Cleveland recruitment efforts. Uh, and I can tell you in, in general 
that one, our out of state applicants who have no nexus with this city is typically a small number. And number two, uh, the one real benefit of the NTN process and their national testing services is, I have seen that for former Clevelanders who are looking to come back to Cleveland and Clevelanders who are members of our military service, they have an easier time completing testing for us without having to come to Cleveland to do so. So, so there is a benefit there as well, but I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't believe in general that using this test company has really altered in any significant way, you know, the mix of Cleveland ver and Ohio versus non-Ohio applicants. But I can get you that data. I, I would I would appreciate that. Thank you. And and the root of my anxiety with you know online applications and a national testing model is that um, you know the city of Cleveland and uh, you know its partners are very, working very hard in the community to recruit people in and develop those relationships and do those relationships translate well into an online format or is it more effective especially with the audience maybe some of the audiences we're trying to reach to have a more personal almost an ombudsman that's going to walk you through help you get something notarized an affidavit things that might not be intuitive to you know a 17 and a half year old uh who you know might not even know what an affidavit is um my, my final question uh is related to the um one in ten process um, could you just briefly, I understand there, there's 10 files in front of you and you choose one. Does number 11 now come in and we're now looking at 10 again, or is it now one and nine and it pairs down until a certain point where it's replenished? Um, well, if I may, through the chair of the councilman, uh, briefly on, on the point of uh, the online application, we have seen benefit when, when the recruitment team is out, they often are setting up laptops for candidates to be able to submit applications right there. And there is a benefit to be able to tell candidates, go home and get online and apply rather than you've got to come downtown during business hours and turn in an application, which used to be our process. So, so again, I, I, I understand the concern and we continue to make things easy and accessible. Uh, but, but in some ways we see benefits to the online process, uh, on the one in 10 process, uh, process itself, councilman, it is a rolling one in 10 process. So you start with 10 as you select one, then the next person is added and, and forward down the list of candidates. Thank you. Are, is there a, a after a certain number of reviews, are candidates removed from the list entirely? Um, well, the candidates are not removed uh, from the list, uh, Councilman. Um, after they have been considered seven times, there is a, an ability for the appointing authority to say, I'm going to consider this person as passed over. And that's done in circumstances when, when they are looking at candidate and perhaps a couple of candidates in that 10 that they don't believe are suitable for hire. And I say it's discretionary because if they are qualified candidates without a, an objective reason to uh, not be hired, then the appointing authority can continue to consider them. And, and the reason for that distinction is a critical one because what we don't want, especially as we're hiring a large academy class, what in theory could happen is as you've done 45 picks, you now have 10 people in that group that you've passed over a number of times, none of which you now want to hire. And we have seen situations in, in prior cycles years back under our old process where a division was forced to hire the best of the worst. And so this process is designed to allow people that are qualified to remain, but also give an opportunity to a, a hiring authority to, to give appropriate consideration to candidates that, that they may not want to hire and then ultimately set them aside and continue to consider the best qualified candidates. 
Thank you. Um, I will. I will be honest with you that there's a large portions of that that give me discomfort, and I know there have been issues in the past where Cleveland residents have been removed by the appointing authority as you know a number eight, nine, and ten on the list. Um, and uh, to me, you know, as now we're looking to hire uh, 80 people off of a list of 159, should that be a list larger than that of people who performed well, are Cleveland residents? Um, maybe were passed over for whatever reason, maybe they had something on their record, you know, a, a youthful indiscretion that uh, was pertinent now, but is maybe not so pertinent, was pertinent then, but maybe not so pertinent now. To me, it's, it's, it's surprising that we would be so quick to pass over qualified candidates. And what I learned from that process is that residents were able to contact the city and request to be re reinstated back onto the list, but there was no notification of that. So it was only through contacting members of council uh, that that was able to occur. Um, so, so to me, that is another fundamental point that I think council needs to be aware of and that we need to monitor uh, to ensure that the intent of this process is, is that the process is functioning as we want it to and it's serving residents across the city and, and not leaving people allowed due to technicalities. Right, so we're at, you're about at a time limit, Councilman. And that's fine, that, that was my last question. Okay, thank you. So. Councilman Anthony Hairston. Thank you, did Mr. Uh, Spring uh, wanna respond? I, I'm, I'm curious on that last point that Mr. Uh, that uh, Councilman Slife just made. Secretary Spring. Well, to the councilman, uh, through the chair, uh, we have, I've had a number of conversations with the safety director on this issue. And I can only assure you that every candidate that is a qualified candidate and a desirable hire, uh, as he takes his holistic approach to this process, they will con consider and they will hire. There, there is not any desire on our part or on the part of the any of our appointing authorities, including public safety, to just arbitrarily exclude people because they've hit some limit of considerations. Now, in the past, I will tell you that the rule was candidates were considered four times. So if anything, we are giving more consideration to candidates but, but the intent of being able to pass over candidates is to be able to not hire someone who is considered unfit or, or not qualified. Now, uh, to the Councilman Slife's concern, um, there was, as we were first implementing this process, um, a, a hiring selection round that was done and candidates had been excluded as, as he indicated. And after conversation with the safety director on that issue, uh, candidates were brought back in because again, they are not removed from the list. They can still be considered. And so that did happen to address that situation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, to the chair. Do Mr. Spring, so you leave, you bring me to a point that I had. What does qualify an individual, right? What are we using to make that determination? Is there a form, which, I mean, if it isn't, it should be, right? Because if there is, there is uh, individuals who are arbitrarily being disqualified, and I know some may feel that they can cut both ways, but at the end of the day, for those that may have a minor infraction versus someone who maybe who don't, is that I guess I'm just looking at a way to create a level playing field across the board, right? And that if there is, is there, and I guess you can answer the question, is there, is there a particular document or is there a, a form or something that is being used by uh, those who make these selections on what disqualify these individuals from being able to either remain on the list, move to the next phase or so forth? Uh, through the chair of the councilman, um, I know that was a, a question of, of concern in your conversations with Director Howard <clears throat> yesterday. Excuse me. Um, I don't have, and I don't, I don't uh, have available to me a, a specific list from 
the divisions on disqualifying events. I know, I, and frankly, I don't do the hiring, the divisions do, but I will tell you that in general, they all have factors that they look at. And certain, some of them are, are obvious and, and intuitive. You know, if it, there are by law, certain things that can disqualify you from becoming a police officer. Uh, Correct. Convictions, domestic violence, other things. And, but then, then you enter an area of, of a combination of things. So, I, but I will tell you that in general, every effort is made to give real consideration to candidates. And one of the things that I know is considered is, okay, this, this person had something when he was 16 years old, he's now 22, nothing since. That is considered mm -hmm. in an appropriate fashion. But when you have a candidate that you may not have a single thing that is potentially disqualifying, but then you're looking at, well, they've got uh, a, a series of employment issues, you know, time and attendance problems. Uh, they may have other factors that come out of the background that, and in a composite fashion, make a candidate a riskier hire. And I, I can't quantify all of that for you um, because it's unfortunately, the problem with, with establishing a strict checklist or scoring system is that, yes, it makes it transparent, clear, and obvious for everyone. And there's real benefit to that, no mistake. But there has to be some discretion in making hiring decisions because the combination of things that, that occur in the holistic assessment of a candidate are hard to put on paper in a way that's, that's truly quantifiable. But I will tell you that there is a profound desire to give candidates every opportunity and to give them a chance to explain things in their past. That's done as part of the process. And all of that is taken into consideration when those files are under review and the divisions are consulting with the director on those appointments. Sure. And, and Mr. Chair, through Mr. Spring, I mean, I agree. I think that there has to be some ability to give or show some deference to a situ particular situation that may have occurred in a person's life. I'm not saying that that is something that is, it should not continue, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm also saying that there are things that, yes, that are obvious, as you stated, that disqualifies you for being a doctor or a police officer or and so forth. But then there all should be also to be some, whether it's checklists or whether it's form, uh, that is that is clearly indicated that 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 some things are just just not tolerate right, and then there's some things that are able to be given a second look and for the minute for the administration or whatever to put the department to be able to look at and determine whether that is something that they want to again that deference for them to have in order to make a determination on whether they uh, proceed or they uh, make a decision to skip them for now and then come back later. Uh, so I, what I would suggest, what I would say, Mr. Chairman, to um, I know uh, Chairman Griffin is on, but to the departments and to HR, that that is something that we look deeper into, whether it makes sense to have that and whether that's uh, we, we can strike a balance, um, you know, with, 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 with a, some sort of form or document list or, or checklist, rather, uh, as relates to those who uh, are, are, are disqualified, you know, Having again the deference is fine, but having something there in place that can you know can maybe deal with some of the concerns that some may have regarding why the, why was this person disqualified? I mean, what base did you make that decision, and so forth? So I'll move on from that point, uh, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Spring. Council, Councilman Slife talked about the testing, right? And so as we've heard in the past that you know some people test well, some people don't. The mayor said it himself, right? And you also mentioned that you personally don't believe that there has been anything or there's anything sort of, and don't quote me, um, an issue with NTN and the testing and, and the way maybe the process uh, is happening. But has there been, when was the last time we have evaluated NTN? When is the last time have we, have we, um, have we had someone or your department or whomever that is or HR, you know, evaluate sort of the outcomes of NTN testing, right? 
uh, their practices on, 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 on how they test, you know, maybe the, the language they use on the test. I mean, has there been an in-depth evaluation of this vendor uh, at any point? Um, and, and if there has, when was the last time that that was done? Through the chair of the councilman, um, in general, uh, we evaluate our test results on an ongoing basis. Uh, when this vendor was initially selected, one of the things we looked at was issues of adverse impact and the right. validity considerations that go into testing and having appropriate testing vehicles. And we monitor that, we, we get data from them as to their national results, as well as our city of Cleveland results. But I'll also tell you that one of the things that's on my list for this year is to push out and renew a, an RFP for entrance testing services, just to make sure that we are getting the best and, and state of the art testing services. I, I think the divisions have all been pleased in general with the results we've gotten from that test vendor. But to your point, uh, periodically we need to revisit and make sure that we are getting the best results. Um, but I, I will tell you that um, our test results and we review them in the hiring committee don't suggest to us that there is a, an inherent problem with that test vendor uh, in terms of what the test results are providing and, and what we're getting from them. Um, I, I also, if I may, one quick brief response uh, on your concern uh, on disqualifiers. I absolutely agree. Clarity and transparency have value for all of us. And one of the things that we will continue to do is to make sure that that is expressed uh, both in how candidates are advised as what we look for and how we move forward and make selections. And we do encourage candidates if they have any questions about whether or not they're gonna be able to be qualified, we tell them go ahead and apply because we want to look at you, we wanna consider you. So I can only tell you again that we make every effort to give every candidate fair consideration. And, and in that point too, I'll add, uh, I, I uh, spoke uh, shortly after uh, this council decriminalized uh, marijuana offenses. I, I, I told Councilman Griffin at that time that I was happy to see that done because that's a it has been a needless cloud on far too many applicants portfolios so to speak and i and i'm uh, so to your point we don't want things of no consequence to become an issue and we work to make sure they're not sure thank you uh, for the response uh, through the chair to mr uh, spring at least for me and i'm sure some other colleagues will sit, would would maybe disagree to a point that the results have, have you know that there's been no issue in terms of the results, right? Because we see the, re the results and the numbers on the applicants that come out of the testing, right? So I would suggest maybe look digging deeper into, and I get that you're gonna issue a new RFP uh, for a potential new testing vendor, but I, I would implore us, uh, the civil service department, HR, and whomever um, that will fall up under, really dig into the, the testing, the way in which in NTN tests, you know, the type of testing, you know, language used on the test and, and so forth. Uh, because I, I, to me, there, there is a problem, right? There is a problem with the results and those that we are, that we are um, yielding uh, after they have gone, applied and gone through the testing process. Some, something isn't working. And maybe that, that evaluation may find that, you know, it is not a result of the testing, but maybe it is once it gets to the particular department to make the determination on who they select and who they who they don't, right? But I think that we can, if it, doing this will check that box off of the list mm -hmm. and us, for many of us who are who are trying to figure out and understand what is the problem, right? If, if, it's, if we have changed the, 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 the eight documents or 10 documents that is needed to prove residency, now we have one document that is step, that is one one step. That's one box checked off the list. And if we have evaluated the the, the third party test and vendor vendor, 
and determine that you uh, that the, their their language on their test and how their test is not discriminatory or provide or, or yielding adverse and yielding an adverse impact. That that is another box we check off. I mean, so I, I mean, I, I think is 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 critical that we that that happens, right? So that gives a level of comfortability to a point for many of us who have who believe that there's a concern and there's an issue somewhere within the system, right? Um, and maybe taking the testing piece off the table um, once that evaluation happened to determine that there is there is not an issue with the testing, but maybe the issue is in a different part of the system as you as you continue to to move through. Um, Mr. Chairman, my, my next question for um, Mr. Sprague, have we on that same line of, of question, have we surveyed or those who have taken the test uh, and who have been hired on and maybe those who have not to, to hear what they have to say about the test, you know, whether maybe they've taken a civil service test in another state or somewhere else, right? And, and, and their thoughts on our um, testing versus maybe somewhere they have taken it or just their overall thoughts about the process that they've been through. Uh, through the chair, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, through the chair of the councilman, uh, a couple of things. Um, we have, we do not every test cycle, but we have, we do periodically work with recruitment uh, public safety recruitment to reach out and survey applicants and candidates, both those that stayed in and both those that did not, to assess their opinion of the of, of the process. And it, most importantly, I keep coming back to we lose too many people in the process before they even test. And we have talked a lot to candidates that have not done that. Um, and and there's and there's a significant point here that I want all of us to understand. One, you know, recruitment is wonderful to get people in the door, but if we don't keep them in the process, it affects our numbers. If we look at this 2018 list for fire that we keep talking about, our applicant pool for that list was 28, almost 29% black candidates. The people who took the test ended up being only 13% of the list were black candidates. So we lost a lot of people before they ever took the test, either because they were rejected and didn't turn in things they had to turn in, or they just never showed up and took it. So this is why I have stressed with you our strong efforts to work more closely with candidates, support them and encourage them through the process. Because I think to your point, where's the problem? That's where I see the biggest impact is people drop out of the process and, and sometimes they just change their mind and that's okay. But I wanna make sure that we do everything we can to keep them. Now, the other point I'll make on the test that I think is also important to know, one of the things that made the NTN test attractive to us and to the divisions is this. Traditionally, public safety testing is done with a lengthy written examination, which some will criticize, some experts criticize those types of exams as being, as a practical matter, a test of reading comprehension. And yeah. oftentimes that can work against us. So mm -hmm. the NTN test is structured around a set of video scenarios that assesses how candidates react, how they interpret all of which are designed to assess a candidate in a different way and takes that issue of a heavy reading component off the table. So, and I, and I want to make sure you're aware of that as well. But uh, on all those points, yes, we will continue to evaluate and assess uh, because uh, at the end of the day, we want what works and works well and we will tweak and adjust as we need to. And Mr. Chair, uh, to uh, Mr. Spring, I mean, that's good to hear. You know, again, that's information that that maybe, well, obviously we don't know, right? That their way of testing is different, that there's some things that uh, they are doing differently than, than what has been done in the past. And so, again, you know, having that information and knowing that uh, always uh, is, you know, is helpful. Um, but I really think that 
we should, I know we, we, we survey and we, and we, you know, talk to folks maybe who have made it through, but I think we should make it a point and whether that's through recruitment uh, or, or whatever process that is uh, to really, you know, hone in on our um, thereafter, right? Communication with the folks to figure out, well, what, what, what made you continue through the process? Maybe they had a friend who also applied at the same time and who didn't, you know, continue. Maybe they can share some insight uh, about what that what that looked like for them. Maybe they were they were um, they were um, faced some sort of issues personally within their life, or maybe they were intimidated by a certain point of the process, or, or whatever that is. But really putting a greater focus on evaluating and surveying surveying those who um, uh, through some sort of evaluation, surveying those who have uh, been through the process. Because I am interested in why, you know, we have a 29% of applicants who are Black, and then we end up with 13. Again, some maybe who changed their mind, and then some, we, a majority of it seems that we just don't know what, what happened, right? And so a few days ago, when we were talking about the topic of recruitment, and, Mr. and Detective, I believe it's Collier, was on, mm -hmm. and they indicated that recruitment follows the applicant from point A to point Z in the process, right? And so you know, having a greater understanding of what that looks like. Is it a one-time follow-up and, you know, a second follow-up or are we going to visit them and knock on the door? As I indicated before, you know, if, if there are individuals who are applicants who live in my ward and they have fall off the process or fall out of the, uh, the, the circle for whatever reason, let me know. I'll go to the house, right? I'll go knock on the door. I'll go try to help track them down and locate them as well, just to kind of understand where they are and in fact that, that it, it, it makes me feel that we've done all that we can do right to help uh, 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 bring these individuals uh, into the process and, and make them feel as if that they are not alone as they move through this um, as they move through this uh, the, the, the process and and trying to um, to join one of the departments um, are we monitoring through the chair to mr. spring? Um, the candidates that are selected once that that the, that candidate list is given to the department, who's monitoring that? Who's who's looking at, you know, that list once it's generated uh, and sent to the departments or who they have chosen and looking at what determining factors that has been used to either disqualify or accept an individual um, uh, to begin the next phase. Secretary Spring. Uh, well, through the chair to the councilman, um, every hiring department, not just in public safety, um, has to observe certain structural steps in, in how they evaluate candidates. But um, well, well, Mr. Chairman, I'm jumping in, I'm civil service uh, specifically. Who keeps the list, right? Is that the question, Councilman? So no, no, well, I, I understand, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm sorry. My, my, where I was going uh, through the chair of the Councilman with, with my comment is, you know, we maintain the list. We provide the list of candidates to the department. The department tells us who they selected. Mm -hmm. um, we do not receive a report from them for, from any department, much less public safety, that says we hired uh, one, two, three, 12, 23, but we didn't hire number four because of this. Um, we, that is not information that they are, any department is required to provide to civil service. Mr. Okay. Chairman, uh, through Secretary, um, uh, Mr. Spring, I think that is something that has to be addressed, right? There has to be some level of accountability and oversight it, because, you know, Clearly, there's a there's a we we've, we've had this issue of, of 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 finding black and brown people and other minorities to 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 be a part of not only public safety but other um, you know some even say there's other departments as well right but as it relates specifically to public safety that Mr. Chairman I, I would say to you also that you know into the into Chairman Griffin you know looking at you know, working with administration and, and there's a way to pro provide greater oversight on, you know, who's selected, right? In terms of, you know, what, what are the determining factors that are being used to, to uh, disqualify individuals and kind of looking at 
you know, so they so those departments know that there is eyes looking at who you decide decide to select because sometimes if 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 individuals believe that nobody is actually really looking and paying attention to who they are hiring or who they're selecting, sometimes decisions are made within the back end, right? In a way that you know may not yield the outcomes that we all want to see. But I but I am encouraged by our new safety director uh, and others who have been bought on and put in place over the last year or so. That, that those type of um, um, uh, uh, levels of, 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 of uh, engagement will happen, as Mr. Spring has said. So I would just say to the chairman and to Mr. Spring that there is, that we look at, and I don't know if HR is listening, if there's a way for us to really uh, dig down into, you know, those lists that are created and who is selected from those lists uh, and, and we provide some sort of, you know, oversight on um, some of those those selections uh, that are made. So just a, just a thought from me, um, and I'm in interested in hearing a response from uh, Mr. Spring. Secretary Spring. Uh, th thank you. Through the chair of the councilman, um, we have looked and continue to talk about that very issue, councilman. I, I don't want to dismiss it, I'm not, uh, because we all know that the phrase, well, they just weren't the best candidate often is coding for, for many other things. Right. Uh, and, and so uh, I understand your point quite well. And I will tell you that I have had conversations with departments, not public safety, where they have said, well, we don't like anyone on the list. Well, that is the list you are required to use it. Um, and that may come from a variety of reasons. I'm not suggesting bad motives, but my point is that um, a, an essential part of what my office does is to provide, or as best as possible, a level playing field for all our candidates and all our applicants and make sure that they are all given fair consideration. And we will continue to do that. And I will raise in the, in the hiring committee again, uh, this issue of, of, of trying to track better uh, the issue of, of who's selected and why, because I understand the concern, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I'll, I'll end with that, um, but to, the, to Mr. President, Chairman, that, that we, we continue that conversation and that is something that I feel strongly about that with this hiring committee, and as Mr. Spring said, that, that again, they understand the very point that I just brought up and I continue to talk about that. Uh, but Mr. Chairman, I would say that we we really, 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 we, we continue to drill down on that particular uh, uh, topic and that we, um, as we continue through this uh, budget process and, 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 and beyond, that that is something that we stay engaged on. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Harrison. And uh, one thing I'm gonna take away, my main takeaway that I wrote down from your line of questions is that, um, you know, it seems everybody is working towards a problem but the numbers aren't reflecting it. So we have to just keep Correct. doing it. Because, exactly. You know, you thank know, you. To your, to your mm -hmm. point that uh, what, I, what I've got written down from what you said is that the numbers don't reflect. So that's where we're gonna have to keep focusing on. So I appreciate your line of questioning. Um, that's why I, you know, let you go, go beyond time because what you're asking I think is critical to what we do. So I appreciate your line of questioning, Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilman Joe Jones, you're on the clock. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, to uh, um, the Civil Service Commissioner, Mr. Sprang. How long have you uh, been at this job doing this? Uh, I have worked in, uh, to the Chair of the Councilman, I have worked in, in civil service uh, for um, approximately eight years. Uh, I've been the Secretary for uh, the last two years. Okay, um, Mr. Um, Mr. President, this is one of those, um, the Civil Service Commission, we don't never really get an opportunity uh, to hear from them. I know that in the last three years, we haven't had it. The only time we've heard from the Civil Service Commission is only during budget hearings. So I would request, Mr. Chairman, because this uh, is a lot to unpack and unravel. Um, if we could have hearings, um, uh, concerning the civil service so we can really get down because there's a number of questions. First, I want to just say um, thank you out of all the different directors and commissioners and not saying that any, take anything away from them, 
Uh, you certainly came prepared uh, in your statement and the comments you made in your statements to try to address a number of issues uh, that the council had been dealing with um, earlier in, in, um, in the budget hearings. And so I just want to say thank you for being coming and, and being prepared for this. Um, second, I'd like to request a copy of your statement if Ann Tilly is, is she, or is that John James who would be getting the information, if we could get a copy of your statement, uh, that would be um, certainly, I would like to take a look at that. Um, and then second, and, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the late Cecilia Huffman, one of the things I can remember from her was uh, coming in in the 1970s under then Dennis Kucinich administration. And one of the, the issues that the, the leadership at that time was dealing with was the Civil Service Commission. So it has been an ongoing issue in terms of getting African-American applicants uh, hired into the city of Cleveland. It has been a long history of struggle, uh, going back to then the president of Cleveland City Council, George Forbes, and then being an issue in, in uh, 1998 uh, and 2000 in the city of Cleveland, uh, talking about how we test and who gets an opportunity at the table. And so I'll say this, because this is significant and important, I think as Americans, we've set systems up uh, that unfortunately uh, keeps the door shut on African Americans having an opportunity uh, to be hired in. And so I, I, you know, I strongly feel, Mr. Chairman, that this is one of those uh, institutions that have been established. Uh, There's no way that when I look at as a rational human being and a citizen of this country, um, that I can look across the entire landscape of America uh, in minority communities and urban populations and you have a police force that's 75 and 80 percent um, uh, whites and you have a community that's 90, 60 percent or 70 percent black and you don't have that diversity into those programs and you know Cleveland is one of many cities across the United States of America that have been shutting out African Americans from having an opportunity Opportunity to serve um, as firefighters, police officers, uh, and, and, and having a fair shake at everything. So um, that's the reason why earlier, Mr. Chairman, I asked the question, show me the roots. Let me, let me take a look at, you know, and I think Mr. Slice touched on this. You, we, you talked about a list that was only supposed to be in operation for one year. And that's what the discussion was, but then somehow the commission changed it to two. Can you elaborate on that and how that happened? Uh, through the chair of the councilman, um, you know, nothing at all nefarious because the, the thing to put that in perspective, if we had extent, if we had kept that as a one year list, then we would have had hundreds of candidates who applied and tested who never would have been considered because during that first year, there was no class hired off that list. So at the time that it was established in a public meeting, that list was established for two years to ensure that we would be able to give candidates who had gone through the process an opportunity to be considered. That's the only reason it was extended. It wasn't done in any underhanded fashion. Well, it was done to well, ensure people had fair opportunity. And, and that's the reason why, and, and I'm not saying that it was, but if, if if you said it was established for one year, but you extended to two, uh, we have programs in the city of Cleveland where um, the citizens have to every year apply for those programs. So they're not locked into those programs. They have to apply. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, locking that in when, and, and then the question is who, who made that decision? So it's, it's, it's all about who, who's in power and who makes decisions. If it was set for one year, then it should have been set for one year. And then if you had to go to a second year, go start the retesting over again and, and, and get the right applicants in. That way, it doesn't look, Nick, 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 what was the term you use? Nefarious. Nefarious. So if, if it is a situation where it could even look like it's not right or nefarious, we shouldn't even did it. It shouldn't, because then it asks us questions on how your operation works. And, and basically what we're dealing with right here, unfortunately in the city of Cleveland is the absolute failure for 100 years to have African-Americans who live in this city have an opportunity for employment, to be able to serve 
uh, as as firefighters and police officers, and we have we have not yet gotten over the twenty five percent mark in none of those categories, and we make up fifty percent, fifty five percent of the population, and in some instances, some even argue sixty percent. So at the end of the day, you know, my thought is, Mr. Spring, when I look at other countries like. Israel, they, they have all of their, their people serving in the armed forces. Their young people serve. Those who have criminal activities in the whole nine yards have an opportunity. My, my, um, and I sit down with some of my um, Jewish brothers and sisters and, and they, they serve in the military. There's nothing keeping them out of the military. No, 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 uh, you know, close the door, you have to take a test in order to, to, to serve, in order to be uh, uh, in, to, to be a police officer in, in, their, in their systems. So I think that the systems that we've set up here in this country are systems that discriminate against African-Americans. And it's so obvious that that's the case. And so, um, you know, Mr. President, um, if we could hold and have a special hearing on that, um, the request that I, I asked the director and I'm asking the commissioner here now is I'd like to have your book of processes, policies, your rules on civil service. What, what are the rules and the policies? We can make and that then, available. And, and then having that information and accessing it and then having an opportunity to talk to you, Mr. Spring, because I'm quite sure you, you do a great job at what you do. So I'm not saying anything towards you at all whatsoever in the, in the job that you do. I appreciate the fact that you came prepared and I'd like to have an opportunity offline to really fundamentally understand how um, this commission process works. It has been a contentious situation. Uh, I at least know back in the, the first eight years that I served on Cleveland City Council back in 97, 98. And, um, and it still seems to be stuck in the same place where we still have not yet been able to have uh, programs of employment that really reflect the diversity of the city of Cleveland. And then here's the problem that, that we're having, Mr. Spring. We're, we're having a lot of our younger people who've lost hope in this city. You know, they've tried to come on as firefighters. I got people in my family, um, uh, nephews and, and cousins who tried to come on and, and be a part uh, and take tests. And unfortunately, all of them were blocked from uh, having the opportunity to, to, to take a part of that whole process and be ready to go. And one of the things that we have constantly seen is that, you know, um, four weeks before the actual test, then you'll start trying to do recruiting. So if you, if you don't get the information out there quicker and fast enough, then the applicants who, citizens who do live in the city of Cleveland, they won't have a fair opportunity and shot. So that was one of the reasons that we were talking about where was the recruitment team? What are we looking to do? Why aren't we out there ahead of time? And then the other issue is, and you touched upon it in your testimony, is, is building a bridge with the Cleveland Public Schools. You know, how do we work with the Cleveland Public Schools? How do we get the Civil Service uh, a Commission engaged in that process so that we can offer young people an opportunity that are in the city uh, school systems uh, a chance at employment in the city of Cleveland and, and what they should be doing to get themselves prepped and prepared. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I, and I got a little bit of time left, I just wanna Bye. just say that, you know, I really appreciate um, um, your honesty and, um, and I look forward to working with you. And Mr. Chairman, I'll reserve my additional five minutes for somewhere else, thank you. I'm, I'm sure you'll take it, Councilman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilman Mr. Chair, Blaine, if I may, one quick item. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Secretary Spring. Uh, to, to the chair and, and all members of this council, uh, I, I welcome the opportunity to, to meet with you. And, and I uh, had not had a chance to, to raise this issue with, with Workforce Chair Bishop, but I, it may be most productive, and we can certainly do... Uh, hearings if you wish it may be most productive to simply have an inf informational session and just sit down and have a conversation and, and go through all of that uh, and and facilitate uh, some of the conversations that you want to have and I make that suggestion but we'll move forward as this body wishes thank you and, Mr. and then Mr. Chairman lastly I'd like to give the uh, commissioner my phone number so he could call and then we can get together and then lunch will be on me um, right. 
my cell phone number is 216-355-0017. Councilman Joe Jones. That's 216-355-0017. Councilman Jones working hard for you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Councilman Jones. And uh, Commissioner Spring, I will... Um, uh, we'll work through um, Chairman Kevin Bishop, and we'll get that get that scheduled because I think that'd be very helpful for everybody. And um, and and Chairman, I'll leave it to his discretion in terms of what the structure is and how it looks like. But I think that'd be very helpful to everybody to understand the the work that you do. Thank you, Councilman Blaine Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just got to have a moment of brevity, uh, levity. If Councilman Jones get that number out one more time, it's going to be more popular than nine one one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everybody at Cleveland got it by now. But uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, one thing that I uh, do want to um, follow up on is I do think it's a great idea, uh, Commissioner Spring or Secretary Spring, to really have a, a, a working session. And I hope that uh, Councilman Bishop uh, would accommodate that because civil service is complicated. I think former Councilman Kane was right when he said that uh, you're probably one of the few people that understand it. I was fortunate to spend time with your predecessor, uh, Lucille Ambrose, and just being on that other side. And if they think this is hard, try going through an entire department full of classifications and having to reclassify an entire department. You talk about pulling teeth. So I appreciate the work you and your team does. A lot of people don't realize how important you are to the process of hiring. And I do think it um, doesn't do it justice to have this snapshot that we really should spend some time with your department. And I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I think, you know, um, I'm very interested in, and actually Councilman Bashir Jones said this yesterday, is not just the recruitment, but how do we look at the retention? And how do we look at the trajectory? A lot of companies don't just look at from the time of recruitment to hire. They look at the time to the first five years on the job. So then that way you could actually really do a lot of retention and really kind of see how your process is working and really look at the outcomes. One of the things I'm interested in is, do you track that kind of career trajectory? Um, because, you know, I just think that's important to look at your, your career trajectory to see how people have benefited or what barriers or impediments in the, in the civil service process. So I know this is a operations conversation, but budgetarily, I guess I'm trying to understand where can we, you know, where do you see that you could do some realignment to try to, uh, you know, make your process a little bit more customer friendly? not for us, but for the public. Uh, through, through the chair, uh, to the councilman, uh, I absolutely agree that the best way to take some of the pressure off the hiring side is to better your retention because the more people you keep, the fewer you have to hire. Now, in public safety, police and fire, in general terms, you know, we attrit five or 6% of, of our uniform personnel a year. So, so one of the things that affects indirectly our ability to address issues of diversity is that we're hiring five or six percent of, of that force a year. Uh, and, and to the councilman, council president's point, the numbers don't reflect it. And I will say yet, because there are things in place that I think you will see those results. But, but coming to the process, um, we, constantly look at what we do, how we do, how we interact to try and make it easy. I, I will tell you that, um, you know, the, the national testing network model uh, that we use for public safety testing, do you go back to that and on a different point? Um, they charge candidates $49 to take the test. They provide a practice test that costs $25. City of Cleveland pays those costs for our candidates. That's a conversation I had with the administration over two years ago. I did not want cost to be an issue for any of our applicants. So if you apply to any of these suburban apartments, you're gonna pay an application fee. You're gonna pay testing costs. You're gonna pay your own cost to take the physical agility test. The city of Cleveland pays all that because we want people to come in, apply and go through the process. So that's, that's one key point. Um, the issues and work that the recruitment team does 
to keep people in the process is, is something that has become more of a focus over the last year. And I know that's going back to some of Councilman Jones commentary, but I think it's important here is uh, not only are we working harder to make sure people get what they need, whether it's support, information, encouragement, access to resources to stay in the process, but within the departments and in conjunction with human resources, we are looking at a lot of development, retention, uh, job satisfaction issues, because you heard uh, Chief Williams talk about how difficult and stressful the work is that police officers do. And one of the things that we all try to evaluate is finding moments, finding ways for, for, the, for decompression and, and to keep people in our city working for us. As, as I indicated in my earlier remarks, we are refining and trying to create new, clearly defined career paths for people so that you can come in as a call taker and dispatch, work your way up to dispatcher, work your way up to chief dispatcher in a way that's clear and available to all. So we continue to work on those issues, Councilman, uh, and, and it, as with many things, it, it will never be a job that's done. We, it, we will constantly adjust and constantly improve as things change. This workforce is different from uh, the workforce that we had uh, and the applicant pool that we may have had 10, 20, 30 years ago. And we adjust to that to try and give folks as much encouragement and support and what they need, not only on the front end, but also after they're here at the city of Cleveland. And, and all of that is important to us because retention, job satisfaction, internal development of employees in all our departments is an area of great importance, not just to this office, but also human resources and the other departments in the city. And I, I hope that answers at least part of your question, sir. Yeah, that, that's very informative, Director. You really did come prepared today. Uh, just quickly, um, are you familiar with banding? And, and I keep hearing and researching banding, and I've looked at cities like Minneapolis that has they've diversified a lot of their safety forces because they do something called banding. I take it that you or civil service made the recommendation to move the one in 10. Can you help us understand why the one in, why the one in 10 is better, more feasible, fiscally sound, or why did we choose one in 10 over mm -hmm. banding? And what, in your, in your professional opinion, what works better uh, to help with diversity and recruitment? And retention. Well, uh, through the chair to the councilman, um, the I was not directly. My office was involved, but I was not directly involved in in, in the conversations in 2015 uh, with the uh, charter amendment to go from one and three to one and ten. That was done in general to provide uh, a a better, broader pool for selection as appointments were being made, particularly in public safety. And, and I need- Mr. Secretary? Yes, sir. Just, um, I'm gonna just to spend time, but I wanna just chime in on that real quick. Um, council did that. And um, the, and, I, and I'm, I'm very, I think that that was a giant step forward because we went from one in three to right. one in 10. Mm -hmm. So we were in a situation where, where we, we've been over the problems with the one in 10. Imagine if it was just one in three and oftentimes, um, some of the directors would report that they would just wait for the list to expire because after mm -hmm. they would pick from that very narrow pool, there was nobody left to pick from because it moved so slow. So I think that moving to, from one to three to one in 10 is something that council did to expand the pool of those applicants that the hiring authority could choose from. And I, I believe it was a very, um, a very positive step for council, and it, it gave the hiring authorities better ability to choose qualified candidates. But um, just want to make sure that I got there and the council was very involved in that at the time. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that council president. I wasn't here at that time. And I'm no, you're here. before your time. Yeah, I actually ran the campaign for it, but my job was just to get it over the finish line. It wasn't yeah. to create the policy. So, yeah. but uh, I think it was a great move in the right direction. 
I just, you know, and it, and and I understood when we did it. And let's also forget, not forget, even though council led the charge, the voters of the city of Cleveland actually right. did support it as well. It was issue thirty three. I remember it well. But thanks, <laughs> council president, for clarifying that. Right. So, it, 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 I, I take Director Spring off the hook for that, but I keep hearing people sending me emails and saying, you guys ought to look at this banding. And I say, we already did one in 10. And my question is in your professional experience, I, I mean, I think we have a pretty good tool to, to diversify our, our forces, um, but a lot of people are telling we might need to look at banding. So I, I'm researching it, but I'm not sure if you knew about it. Well, uh, through the chair of the councilman, first uh, councilman Kelly, thank you uh, for, for that bit of, of context. Uh, and, and I will tell you that uh, the one in 10 process has generally citywide worked better for us. Uh, and, but we also have to keep in mind that the way that we do hiring in police and fire is unlike how we hire in any other department council because no other department hires 40 or 50 or 60 people at a time. So, so for most departments, when you're hiring one clerk or one accountant, a, a one in 10 is absolutely perfect for them. And, and it works as well in the public safety context. Now to your specific question, I'm very familiar with the concept of banding. Uh, we've been researching and, and evaluating that for some time uh, as a possibility for the city of Cleveland. And, and there's a couple things that, that I'll point out to you. One, a lot of the cities that have gone from a, a prior process to banding had previously used a one in three selection process. In some cities, it was a one in one. I mean, they literally, some cities used to hire straight down the list and, and you didn't have even the option of considering three. So, so some cities didn't go to that from, they went from a much more restrictive process to that. Um, secondly, um, I, I will tell you that, that my research and the research that we've done suggests that not all cities that have adopted that approach have seen any immediate improvement in their hiring demographics. Uh, it, it can have that effect, but it isn't an automatic, which is why I come back again to, it all starts with who's at the table? Uh, who do you have in the door under consideration? And that's a recruitment issue. And it's a, how we keep them in the process, all the things that I've already touched on, because what primarily affects the selections when you're at the table making them, and not, not me, of course, but the safety director and the divisions, is who's in that pool of files? And if, if you have people that didn't get what they needed to stay in the process, which, which we are correcting to the extent it, it exists, we're making sure people stay in the process so that they get a chance to be at that table and be considered. So um, it, it is it, it, another option, another tool. It would require another charter amendment to, to adopt that approach. I, I don't consider it a cure-all, sir. I think that the biggest piece of our numbers issue is, and of course it's not any one thing, but I think a lot of it comes down to making sure we keep a qualified, diverse and inclusive applicant pool coming to the table for selection. Thank you. And Councilman, uh, President, as I close, I I'm glad you brought that up, Mr. Spring, because Council did put a policy to decrim mar uh, marijuana. And a lot of people, you know, were calling me, sending me messages, asking me, why were you doing this? Is it because you're trying to promote everybody getting high? And really, you're exactly why we did it. Um, what you're talking about is because of the barriers that it created for employment and other things that people might have had when they were young college kids and other things and really, um, you know, carried with them the rest of their life. So thank you for bringing that up because um, our policies do matter when we do that. Um, and the last thing, Mr. Chair, just before we go, and I know she signed off, I know we'll probably acknowledge her on Monday, but I think our chief, Natoya walker Minor, is uh, going to be leaving us. And I just want to give a personal shout out. This lady used to be my boss. And um, I'll be honest with you, I learned so much from her. She is a dynamo. And I just want to thank her for her service. And she's a phenomenal person. And we all should just give her a virtual round if we could. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Secretary. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Councilman Griffin. Um, and you even got that uh, acknowledgement of uh, Chief Walker and within your time limit. Good work. 
Uh, Councilman Bashir Jones. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, just a few questions uh, to Mr. Spring. Um, you, you said something earlier um, that, is it true that the departments choose who to hire and then they send that to you? Um, through the chair of the councilman, um, civil service does not, other than perhaps with respect to my own internal specific staff, we don't make hiring decisions. Those hiring decisions are made by the appointing authorities in the departments and divisions. Within public safety, the appointing authority is the safety director. When, okay, when so let, let me stop you there. Let me stop you there if you don't mind, Frank, because I want to get, I want to make sure that that's heard. So, because what I've been hearing is that the finger has been pointed to civil service. What you're saying is civil service only hires who the appointing authority hires. So for public safety, the appointing authority is the safety director. Uh, well, I actually, Mr. Count, to, to the councilman, I'll, I'll, I'll adjust. Uh, my comment about who I hire was related to I'm, me. I'm not, to, I'm not trying to put you in a situation. No, 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 sir. I, 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 but my point is that um, civil service makes no hiring decisions other than my own internal office staff. The hiring decisions that are made by the departments are made by those authorities. They report them to us. They report them to HR. But okay. those elections are made by the safety director, okay. sir. I just want to stop there. I just want to stop there and highlight that for one second, because that's that has not been my understanding. And it has not been what has been highlighted, that in reality, each department has their own appointing authority. And they send the hires to you and you hire who they suggest or who they who they put on the list or whatever. Right, Mr. Spring? Yeah, to the councilman, uh, through the chair, uh, that is correct. Once the selection of a candidate is made from the eligible list of candidates we have provided, at, at that point, the tasks to onboard that person, put them on payroll. Okay, let me stop there. Let me stop there. You're saying, you're saying different things. And I want to, if you can for me, I, I want to, um, I want to be able to answer it succinctly because you're saying some really important things. And if I'm gonna cut you off, I'm not trying to be rude. It's just that you're saying something that I want to highlight. So what you just said was that you basically, from the, the list of people, you send the list that they can hire from. Is that correct? correct? Yes, okay. sir. So you, you are the first filter. Your, 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 your department is the first filter of, of, of potential candidates. Um, I, I, we are the source of potential candidates. You, I, I don't know that I would use the word filter, but yes, sir, we provide the list of candidates through an examination process. Well, that's filtering, but okay. You don't like the word filtering, but okay. Well, you, you take this list, uh, and from this list, you send it to each department, whatever department it is. Hiring, you send that list of credible, I don't call it credible, but for people that to be hired. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So you do play a part in who gets hired. Well, I, I, forgive me, I, I was not suggesting that I played no part. Um, that the role of this office stops by stops with establishing through an examination process who qualified candidates are on a ranked list for hire by departments. And that is the list that they select candidates from. So you yes, we play a role, but we do not select specific hires. Right, understood. But you give, you give the choice though. You give them the, you give them the list to choose from. Uh, it's through the chair to the councilman, that is correct. That is the civil service structure that exists in this city and in this state. Yeah, yes, sir. No, no worries. No, um, no, no issue there. I mean, you have to have these structures in place. Um, so the civil service provides the list. The list is then given to that department. That department then decides from that list. And then that list is returned back to civil service. And then civil service hires based upon the list that was given back 
to civil service? Um, through the chair of the councilman, uh, and, I, and I don't want to mean to split hairs, but the actual onboarding process by which someone is, okay, we picked Bashir Jones to hire, we are now going to put him on payroll. Those functions, those ministerial functions are actually performed in HR uh, through the talent acquisition group under Director West's office. But, but they report back to us who they are hiring and, and in coordination with HR, yes, we finalize that process. Right, Your, so a, th a thousand people uh, apply for a job, they go through your process, you bring that, that list to 500, I'm just making anything up, 500, and then you send it to that department. That department then you say, these are the 500 qualified people that you can hire from. They then look at that and they decide who to hire and they'll send you back, I'm just making up numbers once again, 100 people and then you, then they begin to go through the process of being hired. Um, through the chair of the councilman, um, I, I need to split the conversation. When we look at hiring in non-public safety departments, because I want to make this point clearly. Let's, let's, stay, let's stay with safety. Well, um, councilman, I, I need to make one point to you, and that is each individual hiring decision is made based on a pool of 10 candidates. So if a department's hiring one person, they get 10 candidates, not 500. Now for public safety, because they are looking at a, a pool to make a hire of 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever the, the class size is, they of course get a larger pool of candidates and they go down the list in the one in 10 process as I've described, and they make those picks and they report back who they have selected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So would you, would, you, uh, would you say, Mr. Spring, Chair, so Mr. Spring, that, that the process has not created the diversity that we would like to see in the city? Do you think the process plays any part in it? Uh, through the chair of the councilman, I, I don't believe that the basic structure by which, and by say basic structure, I mean people apply, we test, we create a list and provide that to departments in and of itself uh, discourages diversity. I do not. I think that there are things in the process that we do that can, in adjust and improve the nature of the pool of candidates we get. And that's what drives the diversity of our hires. Chair to this, Mr. Spring, what, what would you say would be the thing that could change or be made better? Well, uh, through the chair to the councilman, I think the one in 10 step was, was an important one. I think um, we continue to look at uh, how we administer tests, we continue to look at how we announce tests, where we announce tests, um, and giving people access to taking tests. For example, one of the things that some cities have done over this past year in a COVID environment is they've gone to exclusive online testing. And that was a model that I was not at all willing to adopt because it would have kept a lot of our candidates from being able to test because I couldn't bring people at that time into city hall or other city buildings because we were closed. The libraries were closed. So people who didn't have, this goes to the digital divide issue. People who didn't have a computer at home, people who didn't have Wi-Fi would not have been able to test for us. And so I was not willing to go that route because I wanna make sure that we give full opportunity to anybody who wants to come in and apply anyone who wants to test to be successful. Now, Director West touched on something yesterday, and this relates to part of, of my comments about the fire, this most recent fire test and cycle. Um, as part of public safety testing, specifically police and fire, we make available to candidates a free practice test opportunity. Less than half of them use that opportunity. And, you know, I, I'll tell you intuitively, if I were looking for a job and I was told I had to take a test and someone said, hey, here's a practice test, you know I would go and do that because I would want to be prepared for that test the day I took it. Not all our candidates do. So one of the things 
that we are evaluating is just like we did with the firefighter mile PAT, we may start requiring candidates to take our practice test before, or not our practice test. Mr. Mr. Spring, Mr. Spring, let me stop you if I can. Uh, Chairman to Mr. Spring, um, or l let me speak directly to, to Mr. President. You know, Mr. President, you know, we, we, we get on these, we get on these, these calls and, you know, you know, we, 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 we give props to people and say, Hey, you're doing a great job, you know, keep the system going. And, and, and even suggested that we should take, we should, we should all take, sit down and have a, 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 a hearing to hear and understand the process. The process isn't working. I don't need to sit down and understand no process. This process is not working at all. And it's proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. We don't need to sit down and understand the process. We need to sit down and figure out how to change this process because the process has not been successful. It has not been yielding the results that we are looking for. But what we do, Mr. President, is we sit down and we say, hey, let's, let's figure out what it is and let's, let's give a round of applause to the people. You're doing a fantastic job. Well, it's either two things. Either one, they're not doing a fantastic job or two, they are upholding a system that does not work. It does not work. It's not working. And the fingers for me has always been pointed to civil service. The civil service has to do a better job. But from understanding what's going on, civil service receive the applicants. I need to understand what's, what's wrong because it's something wrong. It, it, it's not going right. And no matter who comes up on his screen and tells me it's right, the proof is in the pudding, it's not right. This process to me is not just uh, getting the best candidates. It seems to me that it's a process to keep some out and not just people of color, but also women, also others who haven't had the opportunity to, to, to get in a, a part of this, a part of this system. There's something fundamentally wrong, Mr. President, with this process. And from what has been said, City Council and uh, Chairman Griffin talked about the, the, the issue that people, when people vote on these issues and levies and whatever the case may be, they expect to see a change. They expect to see a difference. There hasn't been a difference. I mean, it hasn't been a difference in four years for me, but it, for, for, for some, I hear uh, uh, Councilman Polenzik talk about there's still some certain flaw that have been in place as long as he's been here. And even though the faces change, and even though you know the the uh, the, the, the um, directors change, new faces are only keeping up the same processes, and the processes has not yielded any new results. Um, so civil service, the people come, they apply with civil service. Once they apply with civil service, there's a drop off there. So I would like to know what's that drop off? What was the reason for that drop off? Then that list is sent to the department. And if we just stick with public safety, which is really the, 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 the worst example of diversity, and it just insults my intelligence uh, and insults the intelligence of Clevelanders when directors come on and say, we're doing great. All we have to do is, <clears throat> all we have to do is recruit, you know? And you know what? Your community should do a better job of, of you know, applying. That, that, I, I resent that statement, man. I resent that statement. It is not that. It's clearly not that. It is a system that is keeping them out, Mr. President. And if we're not serious and being truthful about that, then we're gonna to continue to yield the same results. And you know what those results are? Because I know you gotta be getting tired of, for everybody here tuned in and everybody listening, you gotta get tired of hearing us talk about diversity. But if we don't have diversity in our public safety forces or diversity within our city, which our city has to be the example of what diversity looks like in its workforce, then how can we go to a Cleveland clinic? How can we go to, you know, a Case Western Reserve? How can we go to other institutions in the city and say to them, you have to be more diverse. We're declaring racism a public health crisis, but yet and still in our own backyard, we have not shown that. So Mr. President, I, I hope that this hearing that's supposed to take place to really look at the civil service process is not a hearing to tell me about, I don't need to be educated about the process. The process is flawed, it's not working, and it's not yielding is not yielding results. And, and, and that is what any company is all about. A company is about results. And until we change the processes, the results are going to be exactly the same. Mr. Spring, thank you for answering my questions. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Council Mike Plentick? Uh, 
Councilman, before you begin, um, Chief, did you want, uh, did you have a response, Chief uh, Walker? Your hand was up. I don't know where. Sure. Um, it, I have my hand up. It, it's been a while and I thank you for acknowledging me. Um, so to the council president and to the body, I just wanted to add on to what I think I heard Michael Springs say. And uh, council president, instead of a hearing, I recommend a learning session. This civil service is extremely complicated. It's complex. It's a lot of legalistic in it. There are a lot of challenges to it but it's in place um, by virtue of statute. And so um, as opposed to a hearing, I think it would be advantageous to have a learning and sharing session for which uh, some of the complexities could be pointed out. I know years ago, uh, the, the civil service secretary and assistant director of law, Rhonda, used to have these sessions uh, uh, periodically. And I think that that could help to get to some shared understanding. And then from that shared understanding where the challenges are, some that we may be able to correct, some that we, we may not be able to correct so that this there's um, fair, uh, uh, equal level playing field on the knowledge of civil service. I, I'd like to say something to that, Mr. President. I would like to say something to that. Right. And it's important. If it's not important to some, it's important to me, okay? And I still have some time left. Thank you very much. You don't. The, well, then I'm. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll get to that. To Chief Miner, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that this city is doing the best job necessary to have a diverse, uh, diverse uh, employees within our city? Uh, to the councilman through the chair, I think that our city continues to make strides in what we're doing. Uh, the recruitment items that are happening. Um, with civil service and HR uh, using some of the outsourced uh, agencies that Director West spoke to yesterday is helping us tremendously. Uh, the recruitment efforts that were started under um, uh, Charmin Leon and public safety are yielding dividends for us. So uh, what I'll say to you is that we recognize uh, some of the challenges that we've had and we are continuing to make strides. I will also state that um, the city of Cleveland for our employee base for the last two years has received um, an award for diversity in the way that our employee base is structured in terms of race, gender preference based on the GCP diversity uh, uh, scale that they use. So we continue to make strides. Councilman Jones, to your point, can we do better? Absolutely. And that is the work that has been has been occurring. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect science. And we recognize some of the challenges, but we continue to make strides forward. You know, Chief Minor, you know, the, 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 the fact is, is that we don't need a learning session on the problem. And I, I wish that my council colleagues and as council president, this should be as upsetting to you and to others on this body as it is upsetting to me. It should be upsetting that you have 70%, 70% white officers, white men officers in the police department. Why, I, I shouldn't be the only one upset. I shouldn't be the only one talking about this. That as leadership, you should be upset as, as well. And it's, it is disappointing to the city of Cleveland that we are not as upset about this issue. Councilman, uh, that, is, that is not appropriate to suggest- sure, that it is appropriate. It is appropriate. It's Don't not tell me what's appropriate, appropriate for you because you voted for the council rules which it, which prevent us from impugning other people's motives and other council members' motives. It is not appropriate. We are all upset. Nobody has the market on rage or, or anger. Councilman Plenzik, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, please, briefly. Uh, no, uh, Councilman Plenzik, you have the floor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. You know, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, I, I have a historical perspective and um, and I, as I've said, and I will continue to say, I think this administration, and again, no one's going to accuse me of being an apologist or a rubber stamp for this administration. I think this group has taken more efforts than any administration that I have seen to try to diversify our workforce, especially our public safety sectors. Are, are we where we need to be? Of course not. But there are more challenges today as well than there's ever been. And I just want to relate to my colleagues. And before I do that, I want to just re regress, go back a moment. I, I, um, I too want to uh, uh, 
thank um, Chief Miner for her dedicated service to the city of Cleveland. And she certainly has my condolences as being Blaine Griffin's boss at one time. Okay. So I, I can, um, I can understand it, the trials and tribulations she went through there. Um, but, you know, my, my own experience has been um, many years ago. Um, I got a call from uh, then the late Carl Stokes, um, who came back uh, from his ambassadorship and became a judge and asked to see me one day because um, he can he remembered that my mother um, had worked in his 67 mayoral campaign and yours truly had to pass out literature for for him. Uh, I didn't even know who Carl Stokes was. I was just a kid, but my mother told me, you're going to pass this out. And I did on five streets and uh, the Stokes family never forgot that my mother's engagement. Um, but when we, I sat down with him over at the Muni court, uh, and he gave me this whole about the challenges that he had as the first black mayor. But one of the issues we, we talked about is, and this just, just brings my memory back about civil service and how critical it was when he became mayor that, that when he looked at the workforce, how the, the workforce was not diversified in any way, shape or form. And that was one of his greatest challenges to figure out how he can spread the word uh, for people to be aware of jobs uh, and to apply for those civil service positions. He said that was one of his greatest tasks. And so here we go. I mean, from I can remember that discussion, maybe, I don't know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, whenever he came back. Um, about his one of his greatest challenges. And here we are continuing to, to talk about it today. But I will say, um, I think civil service has, has gone a long way into improving the process and to my honorable colleagues. The, the one in 10, um, we had a great deal of discussion in the body about that. There were some people who wanted to keep it as it was, the one in three. But we all felt at the time it was going to broaden our ability uh, to seek more applicants and find more quality uh, uh, people. And there was opposition. There was opposition from some of the safety unions, as, it, as some people might recall, um, who, who was watching this from afar. But nonetheless, we did it. And I think it has improved the process. But as I've talked about when in, this, in our budget hearings, there are many challenges today. Um, I see it we are competing. We're competing against the private sector. We're competing against uh, the private sector that pays more money. Uh, we're competing, especially with the safety forces and specifically the division of police. The fact, as the chief indicated, it's getting harder and harder to recruit because of uh, the vilification of, of the police officers in general, uh, because of a, what a few bad and, and, and corrupt individuals have done within law enforcement across this country. So there are many challenges that we've never had to, uh, had to uh, be confronted with. And I will say, personally speaking, you know, I have two of my sons took civil service tests. I, I've never really encouraged my, none of my kids, my five kids to take jobs with the city. Uh, but two of my sons took the civil service test, one for fire, came in 133rd or something like that. Um, and obviously was, was not hired. Then I have another son who took a civil service test, came in number two on a civil service and was not hired. So I, can, I, I have my own observations as well as, as it pertains to the process. But, but what, what is important, it all goes back to, uh, what, going back to what Carl Stokes said to me about getting that message out, um, getting that, that out to our citizens that these are jobs that are available and you need to apply. The other component is that, um, let's face it, we've had issues with our Cleveland Metropolitan School District uh, for the last 40 years, uh, which has not helped us in providing um, uh, basic educational standards and ability uh, for many of our students to, to excel and to succeed in life. So I think we have to look at this in a holistic approach. Um, it's easy to point the finger and say, well, it was civil service and we know, and I've learned over the years, it's not civil service. Um, civil service, I think has come a long way in, in promoting and advocating in, in about the test. Uh, there needs to be proper notification has been brought up, but once we get that message out, but it's the departments and the, and the, um, the commissioners, the directors that ultimately make the recommendations on who gets hired. And at the end of the day, 
we've got to get our folks to apply for the jobs. And I don't know what more I can say about that. Um, our folks, uh, I've, I've been out there um, promoting people to, to take um, uh, apply for jobs with the city. Uh, Councilman Harrison, Councilman uh, Conwell and myself has been reported. We have done joint and community um, uh, programs uh, for to get applicants to apply for the positions. Um, we are just not getting the numbers that we need to apply for these jobs. And that's going to be part of our challenge. Do we seek outside? Do we go with a, a, a PR company, PR firm to promote these jobs, to advertise um, on TV? I don't know what, I think, I think we have to get in a round table and figure out. And I, you know, I, I really like, you know, Bashir's passion and other people's passion at this table and how, um, and, and it, how the workforce is not reflective. But at the end of the day, this is what I do know. We can't force anyone to take a job with the city of Cleveland. We can't force them. They got to do it on their own. And unless we can get more people motivated to say that they want to be a city employee and they want to apply, and, and going back to this whole process of making sure people are aware of the positions and, and that they are qualified for those positions, it's gonna to continue to be a challenge. And my only question specifically to, to uh, again, to Secretary Sprague, and I'll make this, and you know, I, I won't believe it a point, for 2020 of the applicants for police and fire, specifically for police and fire, um, and you can provide to, how many of those individuals are, had, had former military background? If you can, if, if that's an, if you can supply that to us, because that's the other challenge I found that over the years, when, when I looked at police and fire applicants in the day, many of those were people who had been, came out of the military. They were going, they were transitioning from the military into a uh, public service. Um, and that's not the case anymore from what I can see, because you don't have a draft, you don't have all this, this, this other stuff. So that whole applicant pool that we are traditionally tapping into just isn't there anymore. So I'd like to I'd like to look at some of the numbers of the people who are applying, as has been brought up. How many people from the city of Cleveland are applying? How many have pre or prior military service? Give us some give us some parameters so we can really start to figure out, you know, who are these folks applying? Where are they coming from? And what can we collectively do by working? among ourselves and in partnership with the administration, how we can really get the message out there for our folks to apply for these jobs. Because I believe that the process has improved substantially. Are we where, are we, where we need to be? Of course not. I mean, I want a police department. I want all divisions and departments to be reflective of our, of our workforce. I mean, of our, our, of our community. Um, and that should be ultimately our goal. But at the end of the day, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues, um, can't force people to work for the city. Um, and, um, and that's part of the challenges that we're up against. We're competing. We're in a very competitive market today versus the private sector. And that's something we have to realize and we have to figure out how to get around it. And that's why I say, continue to say to the directors and to the administration, we need to talk about the fringe benefits. We need to talk about the uh, what else comes with working for the city that you don't have in a private sector, which I think is, a, is, a, is a, another sales tool that we need to use. So on that point, again, I wanna thank, I, I, I really enjoyed this discussion. I enjoy the passion that I'm hearing at, the, at this, at this um, Zoom session. And how do we carry that into understanding what course of action we need to take? But um, I, I think there's nothing wrong with the session of sitting down to really explain the civil service process. I know when I came in, I really didn't understand it. Um, and it was made clear to me after sitting down and talking with former uh, secretaries of the Civil Service Commission and other people engaged in this process. And um, I think all of us, especially the newer members, need to understand how, you know, what is, what, what is the path here? What is the career path? Someone applies for a test, takes a test. You know, what are the, what are the challenges and, and obstacles that lie before them as they go through this process? So on that note, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. And I thank my colleagues um, for, this, um, for this opportunity. This, this is, there's passion at the table. And we're all trying to figure out how we can get over this hurdle of getting more of our residents 
uh, in these positions. And um, as a result, the residency requirement being thrown out, which I think was had a big of impact on us, um, we got to figure out how to get above and beyond that hurdle. So on that note, thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Plaza. Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Seeing how we're in budget hearings, I'd like to move back to the budget uh, if thank we you. could. Um, Mr. Chairman, to uh, either the secretary or uh, Mr. Kordick, I see that uh, civil service has budgeted for one less employee in 2021, but yet there's been a significant increase in full-time permanent wages. Um, can somebody kind of give an explanation as to why we're down an employee, but we're up by more than 130,000 in salaries and wages? Through, through the, chair the councilman, um, yeah, we're up in wages compared to 2020 because we do have uh, two vacancies as, as of uh, the end of 2020. So there are, are two vacant positions where we had six full-time at the end of 2020 and we're budgeting for eight. So that makes up that difference when you compare 2020 to 2021. But I understand that, but in 2020, we budgeted for nine. So in 2021, we're budgeting for eight, but yet our salary still went up by over 130. Uh, through the chair also, in 2020, we meeting. did have um, some retro payments as well. Okay. Yeah, and, and if I may elaborate uh, to the councilman, um, I think what you're seeing in the 2020 actual is that because those vacancies um, were were not filled at the at year end that number is lower but because the budget forward has to include the full year's salary for those employees i think it, it it may distort the numbers a little bit but i think that's why all right and then under contractual services what are medical services um to the through the chair of the councilman uh that line item specifically is to cover the costs of pre-employment psychological and behavioral uh, assessments performed for public safety, as well as any psychological fit for duty examinations, uh, which are conducted uh, at the request of departments and or ordered by the commission. Okay. And then Mr. Chairman, to the, to the secretary, you don't have, I know it's a, not a large number, but no revenues for civil service in this upcoming year? Uh, through the chair to the councilman, uh, we in, pro in I'll, I'll say once upon a time, but, but some time back, we did charge application fees, which were our only source of revenue. We no longer charge application fees to any applicant, so we have no sources of revenue, sir. All right, and then Mr. Chairman to the secretary, my last question is, and I hope you're going to be able to stay on budget with this one, but you have a motor vehicle charge for the first time of a whopping $7. How on, how do you plan on spending that whole $7? Uh, you don't have to, you don't have to answer that, Mr. Um, Chairman. We can end it on that. Thank you very much. You didn't buy you lunch with that, Councilman. I guess so. A very short road trip, sir. Yeah, the chair of the councilman, I would need to take a look at how we did our, our MVM allocation, but um, certainly it doesn't look like that belongs there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Casey. Uh, Secretary Sprank, thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation and uh, your answer that you gave this morning. Uh, we'll work with uh, Chairman Bishop and we'll schedule a follow-up for the uh, issues we discussed today. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. And we are now going to move to, um, I'm going to pass the gavel to Chairman Kerry McCormick. We're going to do Department of Aging and health. The schedule says health and aging, but uh, Chairman McCormick will would prefer to do aging first and then health, and then we will move to building and housing, community development, economic development, and public utilities. I hope to get this done today. Just kidding. Um, Thank you. So with that, I am passing the virtual gavel on to Chairman Kerry McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Appreciate that. And can we please read Department of Aging? Page 167, Department of Aging, Director Mary McNamara. On page 170, 
salaries and wages, 2020 unaudited, 791,755, 2021 budgeted, 881,319, page 171 for total expenditures, 2020 unaudited, 1,358,771, 2021 budgeted, 1,600,724, and on page 172 for staffing, 2021 budgeted 22, 2021 budgeted 18. Thank you, and Director, do we have you on the line? Director McNamara. I see them signing on now. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting, I also wanted to take a point of personal privilege to congratulate Chief Natoya walker Miner on uh, her new exciting role and, and thank her for work closely with the Chief on issues of homelessness in the community as, as well as other issues in the, in the public health sphere and LGBTQ plus community, all sorts of different things. So thank you, Chief, for your public service and uh, for your hard work on behalf of the community. Right. Director, I see you there, good morning. We see you, but we don't hear you. There you are. Director, can you hear us? I can, can you hear me? Now we've got you. Do you have any opening statements for your budget, please? You can hear me, okay, great. We've got you, Thank director. you, good Go morning. Uh, good morning. Thanks. A little earlier than I thought, right? Jumping before help. So thank you for that. So yes, uh, good morning um, to all for um, on this on this Friday. Um, let me just pull up. Um, so uh, joining me today is Adam Sisler, administrative manager, who manages both the finances and HR functions in aging, among many other things. Uh, this general fund budget covers the salaries and benefits for eighteen permanent staff members in the department. We have an additional 14 staff in the Department of Aging covered by grant funds. Um, we do um, have several general fund grant uh, vacancies at this time, just two uh, of those. The salaries and wages is about 1.24 million of our 1.6 million general fund budget. As you know, the work we do is really about one-on-one -on -one assistance with Cleveland seniors and adults with disabilities. I, I just want to tell you that the strength of the Department of Aging is its employees and their commitment to their work um, was particularly evident this last year during this pandemic and their service to Cleveland older adults and adults with disabilities. Uh, the team at the Department of Aging provided all the services we have in previous years, minus one during this pandemic. We only suspended indoor chores for older adults for both the safety of our residents and employees. All other services continued, plus we added some. I wanna just tell you that we continue to make wellness visits when a senior didn't answer their daily care call. We continue to cut grass and rake leaves. We continue to provide application assistance to older adults, whether they were completing a HEAP application, their age-friendly home repair application, a Medicare savings application, and those are just to name a few. We continued this year to make home visits and meet with residents both in their homes and here in our visitor hub at 75 Erie View. And staff continue to answer phones five days a week, which I have to tell you became even more critical during this time of so many questions. In 2020, the Department of Aging provided core services to 7,124 unduplicated individuals. Our core services, as a reminder, fall into three domains, traditional social services, home repair and maintenance programs, and health and safety programs. We do utilize a statewide tracking system available from the Ohio Department of Aging to maintain our client records. And this really ensures that we are working in tandem with our partners in both the aging network and allows us to track unduplicated clients. I mentioned that we added some new services in 2020 and I just wanna highlight them because they became really important 
First, we use the city's code red system to make outgoing informational calls to residents. We did this when we were no longer able to meet them out in the community. And we did this because we wanted to provide information about COVID. In 2020, we provided 46 and made 46 of these calls. I'll tell you in previous years, we used this system one or two times a year in times of extreme weather. And these 46 calls made contact 761,845 contacts with individuals. So some of those are duplicates, of course, because they heard from us on multiple occasions as this pandemic unfolded. At times it was a message from, the May, about, from Mayor Jackson about COVID or safety, or it was one from me about utility assistance or food assistance or an offering of bringing them a mask to their home. We followed up with thousands of individuals and were able to link them to services. We also in 2020 delivered more than 50,000 masks to Cleveland seniors where they live. We brought them to them. In those early months of COVID through a partnership with the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, staff delivered food boxes to seniors in need. So we had had a small pantry for years. We have a monthly produce distribution at Sterling, but this really launched us into delivering food boxes to homes in the early months of the pandemic. And then through a partnership with the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging, we enrolled individuals in home delivered meal programs early in the pandemic. And now we're working very closely with public works, public health and public safety around vaccine distribution to residents 65 years of age and older. I did want to highlight one program in particular, one I know each of you cares about, the Age Friendly Home Investment Program or AFIP. This is the program in year three that provides 125,000 per ward for home repairs for residents who are both income eligible and also age or eligible because of disability. While funding for the home repairs comes out of the capital budget, the staff who work on the processing of applications are in this general fund budget. This includes an aging services administrator, Tawanda McCoy, and Jennifer Rosich, our administrative manager over home repair and maintenance. I wanna let you know we're in year three of the AFIP program, but our years don't exactly sync up with January to December. Year three for us began in October of 2020. And as you know, AFIP has been a critical new program added to the city's portfolio of home repair resources to help older adults age in place. We are very proud to partner with Community Housing Solutions on this program. As you know, aging staff handle the application approval process and Community Housing Solutions is responsible for the management of all of the home repairs. At the end of a, the job, a building and housing staff member signs off on all jobs before the job is paid. I wanna let you know that right now, aging staff are currently processing 427 applications for this program. We expect to be able to complete nine to 12 jobs per ward. So anticipating about 195 jobs in year three. Right now, Community Housing Solutions is working on 45 of those jobs. As applications are approved in aging, they're sent to Community Housing Solutions. There's very little delay. But if I may, I'd like to recap year two since our calendar years don't exactly sync up with um, this calendar year. I wanna let you know that I think year two was very successful. I wanna particularly thank Community Housing Solutions for continuing to work through the pandemic. As you know, so many of the jobs are outside jobs, roofs and porches. And so it was safe for the program to continue for all. As I looked back at it, 98 of the 119 jobs completed in year two were outside jobs. That's 63 new roofs, 15 new porches, 11 houses painted or sided. And of those 119 invoices approved from year two, 104 jobs are completed and contractors are paid. There are about 15 jobs outstanding, either delayed due to weather or inside jobs and COVID. I would be remiss not to mention that Community Housing Solutions also brings more dollars to the table and really increases the value of this program. In year one and two, they brought in additional $640,000 to this project, and they expect to bring an additional million dollars in year three, primarily from a grant from the Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati. What this means to all of us is that when they go in to repair a roof, 
if a person is income eligible for another program they offer and they see a need, they can provide more repairs to the homeowners and ultimately stretch the value of our dollars. So those are some highlights from 2020. And I uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to talk about the Department of Aging. Thank you, Director. Appreciate that overview. And I just wanted to start by thanking you and your staff for the good work that you've done during this COVID crisis um, in many ways, but specifically around the vaccine distribution. Um, your staff is, is, from everything I've heard from the folks that are reaching out to seniors in the community, following up on their appointments, guiding them through the process to the, when they reach the door of the rec centers, your staff has been tremendous. So please pass along our thanks to you and your staff um, especially on that front. It's important to have, especially when we're targeting seniors in this first, you know, the 1A1B, that we have folks um, that are uh, accustomed to working with our elders and, and know how to do that. So thank you for that work. It's been really important. Um, I will pass that. So, thank you. So director, I'm gonna jump right into the budget. Um, I've got a couple questions and then I will open it up to my colleagues. Um, for uh, budget year 21, Director, there's a 10.8% uh, decrease in the budget versus budget 2020. Can you speak to the, the why the budget has decreased by over 10%? Um, and, you know, to that question, in a time where senior services are growing in importance, do you have what you need to operate successfully? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the chair, thank you. Like every department, we are tightening our belt with um, as a result of COVID and so the Department of Aging is as well. I do think we are equipped to be able to continue to meet the needs of older adults. As was mentioned, our budget here is general fund, but we have um, a significant um, grant uh, budget as well that did expand slightly last year and we hope that it may as well. Those are some dollars from the Ohio Department of Aging through the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging. Okay. So Director, you feel that with this budget, you have what you need as a department to be successful? Uh, to the chair, I do. I do believe we can be, continue to be successful. So Director, uh, in, so we're, we're scheduled, we are budgeted at um, 18 employees this year, whereas from 2020, um, we were budgeted at 22, is that correct? Correct. Okay. So, Director, looking at the, the your list here, I see that we've zeroed out a receptionist position. Um, Director, do you have an admin staff for you in your office? Uh, to the chair, let me just say that the receptionist staff person was going to be in the hub of the entire building, so we still do have an intake specialist here in the Department of Aging, but at 75 year review with multiple departments expecting visitors. Um, that was um, that was a position that um, was not filled. You know, we were granted it last year and then right as COVID hit. So we do have um, the administrative aid, which is the vacant position is one I expect to be able to fill that will provide some additional support to me. Okay, thank you. And director, I would just, from my experience at City Hall, um, you know, and we had the same conversation with Director Collier um, a couple of years back, but how important that assistance is to a director like yourself, who's doing a lot of good work and, you know, your time is valuable and what your efforts are valuable. So offloading some of the more administrative work can be a, gr a really important investment for the city of Cleveland. So I just would encourage um, yourself, Chief Dumas, to fill that role to support the department. The Department of Aging is extremely important. Um, director, all right. If we're looking at um, professional services director under contractual services, there's a significant increase um, from the 2020 unaudited actual to the budgeted. And I believe this was a similar increase in the 2020 budgeted, but just curious if you can tell us what that line item is uh, under professional services. Yeah, to the chair, that line item is for our bed bug contract. And so we did utilize less of that uh, last year, um, but it is still a vital program. Um, Got it, it sounds like it. And then director, um, 
for the special event supplies, there's also a significant increase. Can you speak to that as well? Sure, to the chair. Um, we did not spend what was budgeted last year because there was no senior day. Ah. Uh, is a significant with transportation and food and the events at public hall. Um, that is, that's where, really where that accounted for. We, we did still, and we didn't also have the large senior walk. We did not have disability awareness day, which are three of our really big outreach events, but we did um, continue to have um, neighborhood senior walks. We had 21 of those this year. So we did utilize some funds in that um, budget to be able to provide um, t-shirts for. Okay, thank you, director. And my final question is more of a, a bigger picture question, but director, uh, you know, as we go through the, you know, continue through vaccination process and what the pandemic is gonna mean to our seniors, whether that be, um, you know, food, supplies, health, outreach. I mean, I would imagine social, uh, emotional, mental health is a big issue with our seniors too. Looking at this budget, there is, there, well, there's a decrease. There's not an increase. I mean, is this something that as a city, we have really contemplated about what are those resources projecting out a year, two, five, year, two years, five years that we're gonna need in place to support our seniors not only through the, the, you know, hopefully towards getting to a better place with the pandemic, but even further on, I mean, looking at this budget, are we thinking critically that we have the infrastructure in place to support our seniors? Uh, to the chair, thank you for that question. I think it's, it's a question the entire aging network really needs to look at, right? Both senior center operators, um, uh, care facilities, housing, so as the older adult population continues to grow, as our community becomes grayer, I think it's an important question. And I think the work of programs like the Age Friendly Home Investment Program that we did several years ago, um, really their popularity shows that people wanna age in place and stay in their home. So I think it's a, a conversation we need to continue to have. You know, this tightening of the belt for all of us with COVID, um, you know, puts a pause on that right now, but I think, um, I'm, I'm, what I would say with my work with the vaccine is that the, the response of the entire city to be able to serve its older adult residents um, is pretty overwhelming to me emotionally when I walk out of a rec center that just vaccinated 800 people and I see um, that it takes all of us as a city in different departments to serve seniors. So, uh, Yep. And, and Director, I, that's a great point and I would just encourage that collaboration whether you know, when I toured that rec center, whether it was folks that worked for the streets department or folks that worked in building and housing, you know, I think we've got to, a lot of my colleagues are very passionate around the issue of our seniors, our elders. And I think we need to be thinking more holistically. You're not the only department, right, that serves seniors. And, and, and we need to be focusing on our seniors from a, a, um, uh, from a you know, a um, service provision perspective from the city of Cleveland. So thinking critically about how we can do that and ensure that through the pandemic and after our seniors are getting the food they need, the, med the meds they need, the mental, so social, emotional health, all those um, important characteristics. So thank you, director. Um, I appreciate those, those opening remarks and I'm gonna move on to councilman Mike Polensic. Do we have Councilman Polensic? Hey. Uh, there you go. Now we do. Go ahead. I'm, I'm glad to hear you guys. You got to be respectful of your elders. Remember that always, okay? Um, <laughs> and, I, and I want to thank Mary. I, I heard her wonderful voice this morning as she called me on the, on the recording about uh, uh, appearing at the Collinwood Rec Center on Saturday to get my shot. So I, I will be there. And I I hope that every. I hope there's more people applying than there are only 400 shots available. So I hope there's more people applying than the shots. So at least we can get them on a list. So I hope at some point today I'm going to find out have we exceeded the um, the numbers. And I'm going to be calling you, Mary, and the, the director of public health to, to find out for sure. Um, I want to say to my honorable colleagues, to the president, um, I believe this is one of the most important departments in the city of Cleveland as our, our population continues to get older, and I'm looking at my colleagues in council and I see no one getting younger. 
So we're all in that category. Um, and I am concerned as well as uh, the chairman indicated uh, as it pertains to the staff being down by four. Uh, and I wanna say to Director Dumas and, and to my colleagues in the council president, their reconciliation, this is an area that we should be looking at. This is the department we've got to keep whole. We've got to make sure servicing our, our seniors and our residents. Uh, I want to thank uh, Director um, McNamara as always for being responsible to not only this councilman, but I hear so frequently from my colleagues uh, that you're responsible to them as well. That's important because we are being um, confronted with more challenges today than we ever have, especially with regard to seniors and their inability to uh, support themselves and to maintain the structures in which they live in. You indicated uh, that you have, um, you're approximately uh, going to be providing about, you said about approximately nine to 10 um, um, seniors per ward assistance for the home program. Is that correct? That's correct, Councilman. Okay. Um, I don't, I think this was asked uh, before um, in, in the request made by Council. We had asked for a list of each ward of who has received, um, going back to the inception of the program, who has received assistance and who is recommended to get it this year. Are, are you aware of that, uh, Mary? Uh, through the chair to the councilman, I have provided lists in the past, but I can provide an updated one okay. about uh, year one participants, year two, and then we are still processing year three. And I'll just um, note that we do process those on a first come first serve basis. Yep. And um, that's what's really important for uh, those listening in to know. Um, we are still accepting applications. While we have 427, that doesn't mean that they're all going to be um, eligible for the program. Okay, I, I, I understand that. But I mean, all of us, I, I can tell you in my tenure, um, I have received more calls um, every year, and it's every year more and more of people, of seniors who can't maintain their homes. They cannot maintain their homes. Um, the call I received two weeks ago from an elderly gentleman living in a Glenville neighborhood, he said he was freezing in his house. He was so cold and, you know, what can we do to help him get new windows or, or you know, winterize his home? You get those kind of calls and they're heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And then roofs, um, you know, front porches that are falling off these homes. Uh, just um, people are trying to stay in their homes. This is their this is their only asset that they have left in life and they want to remain in their homes. So I want to say to my colleagues, this is an area that we need to be looking at how we can plug additional resources into. But only do approximately nine to 10 um, seniors per year per ward is, is like, it's minute. It's like a drop in the bucket. I mean, the problem is exasperating every year because of the, the age of our housing stock. It's not getting any younger as well. So again, um, I hope during reconciliation, um, Mr. Chairman and my honorable colleagues and to the leadership team, this is an area that we need to look at. We wanna make sure, I know every director that comes to the table because I, I, I know the line by now over all the years when we ask, is your budget sufficient? And you all smile and say yes. But we know in reality uh, that there are challenges. So again, um, you've lost in this on page. Um, oh, I forget my. I want to go back on page um, 172. You've lost under. You, you're losing an aging service administrator. Uh, you're losing a. Um, let me see what else we hear an administrative manager, you're gonna be down from what was budgeted in 2020. Um, and then as um, the chairman indicated, you're gonna be down a receptionist. And you're telling us you're still gonna be able to, to service our seniors to the director. Through the chair to the, the councilman, I, I would also like to add too that the positions that you're seeing in the general fund budget are just the general fund funded positions. I understand that. The department also has some level of grant funding as well. And um, those positions that are funded on the grant wouldn't be shown on the general fund pages. But Mr. Chairman, to the, um, to the representative of the finance director, um, are the grant dollars more this year than they have been in the past? 
uh, through the chair to the, the councilman. I, I don't know that. Um, Director McNamara would be better to speak on that. Director? Director? Yes, uh, through the chair to the councilman. They have increased um, slightly from um, previous years, as mentioned, the, these are Ohio Department of Aging funds. We hope there may be an additional opportunity. They, they do provide grants um, to us throughout the year. So as the needs have changed during the pandemic. Um, and I will just note, these are positions that uh, two of them were um, staff members uh, resigned in 2020 and were not refilled. Two were, were new positions to us, but the administrative manager and the aging services admin, uh, administrator. So I do believe we, um, we can um, continue to serve seniors in the Department of Aging. So with the, the Mr. Chairman to the, um, to the director, uh, so with the additional state dollars, you're gonna be able to hire more staff? Uh, to the um, director, or I mean, I'm sorry, to the uh, councilman via the chair. You know, I don't know those dollars yet. We know what we currently have, which Adam, I'm going to ask my colleague Adam to give that figure. I think it's about $660,000. Adam, are you on the line? Hi. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. we got you. Okay. Uh, good morning. And yes, uh, to the chair, to the councilman. Um, yeah, I, I estimate our grant dollars currently for the year uh, with what we have secured currently or, or are projecting um, to have about $669,000 in grants, which um, as the director had stated is uh, a little bit more than last year. Uh, and yes, um, we do continue to work with our grant funders to uh, secure additional dollars throughout the year. Okay. well. Okay, and what I want to get back to is my, my original comment is that we've got to make sure we have the staff in place to service the needs and the needs are becoming far greater than ever before in this city. You can just see it. I mean, you just drive these streets and you see the conditions of people's homes. And when you realize that you're working, you're, you've got the age friendly initiative, the bed bug assistance program, the chore program, Cleveland care calls, the free assistance program. I mean, homeless prevention services, economic security, long-term support options counseling, senior homeowner assistance program, senior initiatives, special events. Um, I mean, supportive services, senior transfer. You, you got a lot. Uh, you got a lot uh, on the table here to deal with. This director has a lot, and I, I've got to tell you, when when um, Jane Fumick left. Um, who did an outstanding job. I was really worried. I was really worried. And I got to tell you, I think Mary McNamara has done a magnificent job. Mm -hmm. She has stepped in there and there's, there hasn't been a, she didn't skip a beat. And, um, but I can tell you, you know, she's working, you know, I, I can tell you, I deal with a lot of people and I know a lot of people at city hall. This is a director that works yeah. and, and she works with closely with council members. So I want to say again to my to the chairman, um, we got to make sure she has the, 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 uh, the staff and the support mechanism she needs. And this home assistance program to me is of paramount importance. And I want to see additional resources go in there to help our seniors. So on that note, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. And again, to Mary McNamara, thank you for everything you do. Thank you. And I hope, I hope the mayor's watching because he's got an outstanding director here. Thank you. He does. Thank you, Councilman. And I would ask the director on that line of questioning, um, and I'm not going to ask for an answer now, but to the question of if you were to receive expanded help, what part of this department would you add it to? I think, and, and I'm, I'm going to request an answer to that. Um, you know, I, I understand, like the Councilman said, that you're going to say you have what you need, and, and maybe that's true, and, and maybe it's you, you've got what you need to operate in a, a one level versus another, but I'd like you to consider the question of if additional resources were available, uh, if they were forced upon you, where would you put them? All righty, um, council person, Jenny Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning uh, through the chair to Director Mac McNamara. Great to see you. And I would like to echo Councilman Polensic's comments. Um, when I joined council, Director McNamara reached out to me shortly thereafter and offered me a tour of the Department of Aging. And um, I, I went over and did so. It was a really great way to learn about the, the programs. And I also got this big goodie bag 
of all of the programs. So it's, I, st I have it right here next to me. So thank you so much, Director, M Director McNamara for helping to onboard me to, um, to the city of Cleveland. I, I have some, through the chair, some, some questions about the age-friendly home investment program, which I, I know is of great interest to, to all council members and specifically the question, the broader question of home repairs for seniors, really during our CDBG hearing, some really impassioned um, comments and, and discussion around additional repairs for seniors and the really the need to take care of our seniors. So I, that has really stuck with me from a week and a half ago. And um, so I wanted to, um, through the chair to the director, ask for a couple clarifying questions about AFIP, the Age-Friendly Home Investment Program. Um, the first clarifying question is, um, what are the qualifying repairs for that program? What repairs are eligible? Director? Yes, uh, to the chair, uh, through the chair to the director. Uh, the repairs include um, uh, exterior um, health and safety repairs, roofs, porches, ramps, lifts, interior plumbing, interior electrical. There are a couple ways it differs from SHAP in um, services that we knew we needed when we created this program. One is that it does provide exterior painting um, as a, a resource. So not just the paint, but the actual job getting done. Um, it could also be siding if that fits within the $10,000 uh, cap per ward. The other service, there are two other services that are unique is it does provide some detached um, roof, or I mean, I'm sorry, garage repairs. So with SHAP, if it's an attached garage, that can be included in if there's a, a roof issue with that. But there was not a program that we knew of that provided uh, repairs to a detached garage. Um, unfortunately, you can't demolish the garage, which we had hoped, uh, we, we do get that request from seniors at times, but these funds can't be used oh. for that. Um, and then it also can provide some- oh. Hey Mike, mute yourself, please. It can also Sorry provide that, some driveway um, and um, pathway um, concrete repairs, which okay. we knew were really important for preventing falls. And so it, it matches SHAP in many of the areas, but but different in those four. Mr. Chair, just a point of personal or a point of uh, on that point. Uh, Councilman Spencer, will you allow the council president a point? Absolutely. Council Thank president. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, I would just request that um, that the director um, forward. I know it's already been forwarded, but but again, make sure that all council members have the all of the list of eligible repairs because we painstakingly went over each one and how we could make it as inclusive as possible, and really think through any thing, any one repair that might put a senior in a bad position. So I'm I. I think it's a great list. I think it's very comprehensive. So if you could share that with everybody, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman. Absolutely, Mr. President. So, Anne, we've got those two requests in so far. Thank you. Councilwoman. Thank Councilwoman. you. Yeah, that list of repairs is not on the application itself. So that's what I was referring to, but thank you. I will look forward to that. Um, so the next uh, question that, uh, through, through the chair to the director about AFIP has to do with um, Noticing that there is this, this we had this robust discussion during CDBG hearings about income eligibility, and my colleagues really were having a lot of questions about that. And I noticed that compared to SHAP, AFIP has higher um, a higher threshold of eligibility. Do you happen to know um, the percent of area median income that AFIP serves? I think SHAP is thirty percent, if I recall correctly. SHAP is thirty percent of area median income, and AFIP appears to be higher. Yeah, uh, through the chair to the um, councilwoman, um, this the figure for AFIP is 250% of the poverty level. So in 20, in this year, it's 31,900 for a one person household. Okay, great. Um, but higher than SHAP. SHAP is for a one person household is 18,650. And this for a one person household is 31,900. So I think that's notable. Um, my next question through the chair 
to the director is, do we know whether community housing solutions has more capacity? Meaning if through reconciliation as Councilman Polensic suggested or through other means, additional funds were to be added to the AFIP program, does community housing solutions have the ability to deploy those resources and complete additional jobs? Right now, the budget would allow for between an estimated between nine and 12 jobs per ward. Director, before you jump on that council person, that's a 60% AMI just for the edification. The okay. 31.9 is 60%. Director? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Through the chair to the councilwoman, uh, Community Housing Solutions has proven to be very nimble and responsive um, in their ability to add more staff and get more done. Um, you know, they, they sought out and we provided a support letter for them to get that additional million from the Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati. And, you know, they've really matched that with our work plus doing more. And so I think they are, um, they're an amazing organization. Great. So I think, I think you, really for my, for my colleagues, the, the, what I'd really like to point out here is I, I would like to um, find out if there's a way to, to add additional funds to the AFIP program. I also consulted with our Healthy Homes Initiative specialist who has to have their hands in understanding how all of these programs are deployed. She gave, it, she gave AFIP rave reviews in terms of customer friendliness, for lack of a better word, the intake process that she said that working with Department of Aging staff is um, a great experience. It's really um, a very user-friendly application process um, compared to many of the other programs and resources out there. So uh, across the board, just hearing um, there's a lot of need and there's also a lot of feedback about uh, how well the program is functioning. Uh, I would let, be very interested in further conversation about increased resources for this program. Uh, Councilperson, absolutely, um, and I can can tell you that the Health and Human Services Committee. I, I think that that is a, a topic that a lot of us are interested in. So when we look at reconciliation and other funding mechanisms, I, I agree with you completely. Thank you, and thank you, Director McNamara. Thank you, Councilperson Spencer. Um, Councilman Anthony Hairston. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to, uh, I won't say echo. I guess I'll piggyback. Uh, we've heard echo a lot during this period, but nonetheless, uh, my colleagues are correct that, you know, we are all uh, experiencing a uh, high level of calls from, as director, you know, put it, our population who are graying, uh, you know, more and more each day, right? The need to help them. We talk a lot about supporting our young people in our communities. I know we talk a lot about supporting our seniors, but we we, we really, and this is a great way for us to do that through this program. Um, and the fact council created this because we recognize the need, right? And we, we, we heard that. Um, but during the reconciliation process, I, I, I joined in with my colleagues to say that we, we, we've, done a, we've, done, we've done great work. We have achieved a lot to help a lot of people uh, our senior in particular, uh, because this program also covers those with disabilities, if I'm not mistaken as well, um, to repair problems that they have within their homes. But we, we need to find a way to do more, right? We hear that a lot, oh, we can always do more here and do more there. But this program is a, is a program that there is, is, is absolutely a need for, right? I just received a call uh, two weeks ago about uh, a senior who, again, living in their home, who had, who had, who's, who has buckets, you know, in different parts of their house to catch the water. That's crazy. That is absolutely insane, right? But because they may be behind on their tax bill, a hundred, a couple hundred bucks, that disqualifies them, or they have a uh, a document that they can't uh, provide at the moment. And so once they are able to find that document, then they are pushed to the back of the list. So. Uh, within that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just wanted to make it clear that I am in full support of the, the, you know, this body and wanting to uh, enhance or increase the amount of money that we put into the AFIP program because clearly it, there's a need for it and you know, it is working. Uh, Roger Carney is amazing at what he does. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Chair, 
we have asked that question to Mr. Carney before in the past, whether if more money is given to the program, can they, uh, uh, can they handle the increased workload? And if I'm not mistaken, that Mr. Chairman, that that answer was yes, they can. So as we continue to have these budget hearings, you know, year after year, we, we started off year one with one amount. There was a, a call for an increase. We increased that. I think we continue down that path of increasing uh, the, the number of dollars that we put into this program. Um, so question from through the director, uh, through the chair to the director, are we, we're in year three of the program, correct? Correct. You're in th year three of the program, okay. And when did the year three program application go out? Was that mailed out? Uh, was that put, just put available online? I, how, what, what is that process when the application becomes available and goes out? Uh, through the chair to the director, that application was mailed out in October of 2020. We mailed it to anyone that we weren't able to service in year two. So if they weren't okay. selected, we sent them a personalized letter explaining that. We also then had a very robust list of more than a thousand names we had um, collected in the past year of people who asked to be on the program, uh, asked to receive the application. And so we then through the print shop mailed those all out on the same day. We did make it available on the web, on social media, uh, copies to the council members. And um, you know, I think it was pretty widely known as uh, um, out in the community because people were waiting for it, right? Okay. When is year three coming? Yeah. I will just um, comment, uh, Councilman Spencer mentioned the healthy home specialists. Those have been really critical to us in being able to know people who they could bring it to um, that application. We also, you might remember, we created um, a home repair resource guide. Yes. And that is the compilation of all of the home repair agencies in our community. And so um, this year we printed 4,000 of those um, home repair guides and we um, have utilized uh, the recreation centers, uh, the libraries, even during the pandemic, uh, Cleveland Public Libraries was putting that home repair guide in their drive up bag for residents. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I, I think, I think word, uh, word got out there and um, we, you know, we, we like everyone's help to get the word out. So the person who doesn't even know about the program has really a shot at getting it. Thank you. And Councilman Hairston, Council President Kelly's requested a point. Would you, yeah. you know, Council President? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Hairston. I just wanted to, to chime in real quick um, on, uh, it's come up twice in terms of reconciliation and putting more money in the program. Um, and as most of you know, this started out as $75,000 per ward mm -hmm. per year, and we've increased to $25,000 each year. And while I'm certainly open to continuing that, certainly Roger and his shop could accept more work, but any funds that we need to do, we have to work with the director in terms of the capacity because this um, was intentionally put in aging and not community development so that we could quickly get the program constructed and get the dollars out the door. But there is capacity issues in terms of accepting those applications, um, seeing if they're eligible for any other programs and then putting them in this program. But um, this program I think is one of the, you know, one of the best things council's done since I've been here. And I want to see it succeed and thrive. But I just want to, before we just put money, let's make sure that we're asking the director, what would that look like? What kind of capacity needs do you have to process this deluge of applications? Because this is a very popular program. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And thank you for the point, Mr. Harris, uh, Councilman Harrison. Thank you, Council President. Councilman Harrison. No problem. Uh, and, and Mr. President, he makes a point. You know, uh, we also always have to consider whether the department has the capacity and, you know, if they believe what their current, um, you know, line items, um, whether they can achieve, you know, uh, uh, influx in applications. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, I'm interested in, in hearing from the director to the chair, whether if there, if there was more money, you know, are, it, it, you know, is your department able to uh, handle an increase in submissions uh, for the program? Do you have the capacity at the moment to handle additional applications? Uh, to the, to the, um, Councilman through the chair. Um, I was remiss in not mentioning that we did have a third person who works on the program. Deb Smith is a junior clerk that we were able, that was a new position when sure. we started the age-friendly home investment to be able to help us in processing the application and also really fielding the phone call. So there really are three critical staff involved in it. 
And then on the bill paying side, because the, the paying of the um, each bill from Community Housing Solutions goes through Adam um, on his side. So I'd, I'd want to have a future conversation about just what kind of scale we'd be talking about. Right now, we are okay. Sure. But, um, you know, there, as, the in, uh, as the number of applications increases, you know, while it's less robust of an application than SHAP, it doesn't require six months of bank statements. It right. does require two months and proof of all sorts of incomes and such. So, um, you know, it is a, um, a thorough review of someone's eligibility. So, yeah, I'd want to talk and think about scale. Understood. Um, and uh, through the chair to uh, the director, um, you mentioned the Healthy Home Initiative and the folks who are working through the CDCs have been a big help. And I would say that that's one way, you know, when we when we consider this increase and the council president said it correctly. Yes, we've added every year and I hope we continue that. And, you know, as you look at whether staffing and capacity uh, is appropriate um, to handle an influx, that we look at a greater um, collaboration, you know, so to speak, with our Healthy Home Initiative folk representatives and also our community development corporations, right? Because in addition to the council people, they are also connected to the community. A lot, a lot of folks go to the CDC to get help with paperwork, to make copies, to, to get a technical assistance on app filling an application. At least I know for my for my board they do. They go to Greater Collinwood, the Five Point Center, and they go to uh, Famicos Foundation. Uh, both of those serve as my ward uh, for on each ends. But you know, you know, really collaborating with those CDCs in a way that maybe have, has not always been done, but, you know, looking forward, if that is something that this body, you know, should do and increase the funding to kind of uh, work with them at a, at, a, at a greater level as well. Um, Mr. Chairman, through, through the chair to the director, if I'm not mistaken, I believe prior to the additional funds, were we completing about 10 jobs at that point as well, have we, what was the number of jobs we were able to complete before we added the additional dollars? If I'm not mistaken, I believe it was eight to 10 then also. Uh, through the uh, chair to the councilman, the, the first two years of the program, it was 75,000 per ward. And it really comes in at just 10,200 as our average job cost. Some wards, uh, the jobs come in at a lower amount. And so you might be able to get eight or nine jobs out of it. But I would say um, it, overall six to seven jobs happened in year one and two. And then with the increase to 125,000 per ward, that's where we see ourselves moving to um, being closer to, um, you know, 12, 12, eight to nine to 12 jobs until we get in the okay. estimates, you know, and what's needed. I mean, with so many of the jobs being roofs, I think in year two, 68 of the 118 jobs were roofs. Those are our biggest ticket items. And so, um, you know, sometimes when we have smaller jobs, we can squeeze out another job. Sure. Okay. And I, and I appreciate that. I, I just wanted to be clear on what, if I understood correctly, what the number was in year one and two versus where we are now uh, as well. Uh, but in closing, I will say, uh, Mr. Through the chair to the director, you are doing a fantastic job. You know, there's not a time when I call or email or I believe you text a few times uh, to try to, you know, get a resolve to an issue that maybe one of our seniors are experiencing. So I want to thank you and to the administration, the mayor that, you know, as Echo Council and Polenzik, that, you know, you are doing a fantastic job. Uh, in, in, in your uh, role. I didn't, I did not have the, the um, luxury of, of knowing uh, your predecessor, uh, but you know, you are, you are, you have been amazing, um, you know, every step of the way. So to the chair, thank you so much uh, for the time. Thank you, Councilman Harrison. And, and to your point, and to Councilman Bashir Jones and Councilperson Spencer, and I think there's, it seems like there is a chorus on figuring out how do we not only increase resources, but capacity for this popular program. Thank you, Councilman Hairston. Councilman uh, Joe Jones. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate, um, I, I you know I echo the sentiment of my colleagues as it relates to Mrs. Mary McNamara. Um, you know, she has stepped in. Uh, Jane Sumick uh, certainly was one of, uh, you know, historical figures as it relates to uh, delivering services for our senior citizens. You know, I love our senior citizens population. Uh, one of the great joys that I have uh, being an elected official is having an opportunity to serve older people. 
um, I really relate to our older generation of people. Um, I feel for them. I understand their issues uh, in an intimate way. Um, I was raised by older parents, and so I get it. Uh, one of the, the daunting challenges that as we continue to age as a city is trying to find new ways and revenues uh, to assist us and help us. So as we're going over the budget, um, um, Mr. President, to um, the director, have we been able to get any additional funds in terms of grant writing? I don't see that. Would that be a line item in, 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 in the general fund? Director? Uh, through the chair to the councilman, um, our biggest uh, grant dollars um, come from the Ohio Department of Aging through the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging. And those, those include our programs that are called our Aging and Disability Resource Center and our um, supportive services. We also then, you saw me here a week ago with community development. We're grateful to receive some community development block grant dollars. So those are grant dollars that, um, and then one of the efforts uh, we work in our community, I would say is I've mentioned before, just the strong aging network that I'm a part of that is more than the city. And so when grant opportunities um, come that I think might be better suited for another agency in town, I mentioned, I'm, you know, writing support letters and things like, I'll give you an example, I connect. I knew we had a digital divide my department isn't equipped to do more than just educate people about the technology resources, work with PCs for people, but working with the Neighborhood Centers Association to have them start a program to help called iConnect for seniors. So you might not see the grant dollars directly come to aging, but we work so closely with so many of our partners because we're all serving Cleveland seniors. Uh, we, right. do, we do have a, um, a position for a... Um, grants administrator in the office that really right. helps us with our current grants. Well, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, just real quickly to the director, can you, uh, how much money have we gotten in, in terms of grants? Yeah, through, through the chair to the councilman, our current grant dollars this year are $669,000. So we you were received $669,000? And where, would that, and where would that be reflected in the budget? Uh, that, those dollars, uh, Councilman, would not be reflected in this general fund uh, budget. These are grant dollars, but you would see staff that support that in there. Adam Sisler, who's on the call, is the finance lead in aging. And so he's responsible well, each Mr. month. Mr. Us. Chairman, would that be reflective in the black grant budget then? Okay. Chair of the yeah, so director, is that are those funds reflect in the block club or, or block club block grant or where, where are those? And so those uh, to both the uh, chair and the uh, the councilman, the two hundred and eighty thousand of that is reflected in the CDBG uh, budget that we talked about last week. The remaining dollars are not reflected in either budget. And, These are grant dollars. And, and where and where would that be reflected in the block grant? I'm on the pages now. Where where would that actually be? Director? Uh, I don't know where it is reflected in this budget for community development. It's not an aging's budget. Those would have been last week at community development block grant. I think we were page like three one in last week's uh, handout. I uh, see it and I'm on page three one now. So the only thing that comes close to that, would that have been put in the SHAP chore program? That's exactly right. It's called SHAP Chore Administration, 280,000. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mr. Chairman, um, to the director, one of the things that, that we thought this 280,000, because even in this right here, it did not reflect that it was actually grant money um, that was um, raised by your department. It was sort of like it was actually the actual block grant money. So it, it, it's misleading in here. Um, I, I might ask my colleague Adam to speak about that piece. I, I think it may be just we call it grant dollars. And Mr. Because, Chair, to the yeah, Greg, can you provide some correct. clarification? Um, Appreciate that. Yeah, uh, CDBG will have a memorandum of understanding with some other departments, like the Department of Health and the Department of Aging. So uh, those departments, Health and Aging, for example, will set up uh, a, a grant. 
So it's referred to as a grant. The funding source is CDBG. And, and Mr. Chairman, um, to, um, I don't know, do we have the law department online? Do, me... do we have someone here from the legal department? Yeah, let me check, Councilman. Um, I don't... Here's my suggestion, Mr. Chairman. If yeah. you could just put a sidebar here so that we can talk about this later, uh, is that, you know, when we do these budget hearings, this is no offense against Mrs. McNamara, uh, because I've seen this in other departments as well. We're, we're not listing all of what these departments and the monies that these departments are getting. So we have, for an example, and I just found this out because I was deep diving last night, and that's just not on this department, but other departments who are receiving other funds, but we don't see that in the budgets that are that we get in front of us. There's no presentations talking about, and which should be, Mr. Chairman, under revenues. So we should have a line item on grants received under revenues, page 171, that gives the council a better look at those departments that are receiving additional funds. We don't and that's the problem also, Mr. Chairman, uh, when I was uh, deep diving in the police department, uh, I couldn't find out where there were actual grants, the monies that they're getting for the grants, where did it actually show up in the budget? And so that's the reason why I asked this question, how many grants and what was the grant total for for last year? No, um, uh, Calton, that's a, a really good question. Greg, and then you... how was that expenditure? Yeah, Mr. Yep. Yeah, Mr. Councilman. Yeah, Mr. Sorry, Chairman, Joe. Councilman, um, what what you're looking at right now, and and what we're we're talking about is the the general fund budget. So you're not going to see any grants in this document. However, our CAFR will have uh, some, some uh, documentation on grant dollars. Now, where's the CAFR at? Um, th uh, that's available online. Um, they're currently working on our, our 2020 CAFR right now. The latest CAFR that we have is 2019. And, and again, that's available on our city's website. That's the- yeah, so it doesn't do us any service, Mr. Chairman, when we're actually looking at programs and we need to make decisions on funding. Not having the information in front of us does us a disservice as you And um, not to have the presentations made available from the various different departments doesn't give us a real snapshot at what finances the actual department is dealing with. So, Mr. Chairman, I would make a recommendation that we, um, we, we talk about this in reconciliation uh, about you know, new rules. And the new rules should be that when we're going through our budget, uh, there should be a line item there that talks about the various grants that have come to that particular department or agency uh, and how those funds are expended. And that gives us a better opportunity to know how that works. Because even looking here on page 3-1, uh, to uh, my colleagues under housing repair system programs. We don't have anything here even saying it gives the impression that it is strictly block grant money. So it doesn't tell us that that was actually grant or grant money that came from somewhere else. Yeah. Councilman, on that point, if I can just follow up on that point. Yes, sir. Um, to, to the assistant finance director, why would those grant dollars and expenditures not be reflected in either of these budgets? Uh, those are from outside sources. So, um, you know, of course, grant dollars won't be reflected in, in, in the operating funds budget. Um, any, any funding from CDBG would be shown in CDBG's budget. However, it's from, if it's from an outside agency like um, the Ohio Department of Aging or the Western Reserve Area on Aging, that wouldn't be reflective in the operating or the um, CDBG's budget. In, but why, why is that? It's because that's not what those documents would, would cover. That would be shown in as a whole on our CAFR. Mr. Chairman, on that point? 
Uh, Kelsman Jones, would you yield a point I, to Kelsman Brink? Listen, I would, uh, on these points, uh, Mr. Chairman, I definitely would yield to all of my colleagues. I give okay, everybody, Kelsman you Brink guys listen to me a long time on this stuff. And so I'd yield to all you. Answer is uh, yes, uh, Kelsman Brink uh, Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the, uh, um, the block grant dollars are just that. They're grant dollars that come into the federal government um, and they need to reflect uh, spending for real specific parameters. Um, so we cannot put the block grant dollars on our general fund budget dollars. Right. Um, so we have to keep those separate and those reported separate. And as we stated during the block grant hearings, these aren't the only resources that each one of these departments gets. So whether it's uh, housing, community development, lot cleanup, economic development, those are only a portion of what that department gets. So we make that reference specifically. And we also, when it comes to expend, and when uh, 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 Director McNamara comes for expend on the block grant dollars, um, their department is very specific on where all the sources are for the expend, not just the block grant dollars, but where other sources come in. So that's the structure of uh, accounting. Um, and as uh, the uh, finance director, uh, uh, Cordick said, the, uh, the capper does recognize all the different sources, but we can't commingle them within each one of these funds. They have to be standalone. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. And I understand the block the block grant um, you know differentiation, but I'm curious to the, for example, the state dollars that have come down that aging applies for, which are not block grant. Um, you know, where do those show up? And you got block grant, and then you've got mm -hmm. general fund. I understand that, but those state dollars, uh, where so where? The, yeah, and the, the state dollars are very similar again through all, all the different departments. So, for instance, if we look at our infrastructure, we get state dollars. That come in, but th those st state dollars aren't part of our capital budget. They're a separate mm -hmm. budget. Our capital budget is our match. If it's 20%, or sometimes if it's zero, um, but that is separate. That cannot be on our budget. Yeah. So I think to the question, and Councilman Jones, correct me if I'm wrong here, but is whether it's a state dollar or otherwise, getting a picture of the sources of revenues and expenditures into the budget to get a holistic understanding of the finances. I think is what kind of more of the point on this. Councilman uh, Jones, does that sound? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, you you really summed it up really fast and quick. Um, the It doesn't give us, an, uh, when we look at the budget, the whole purpose of going through the, and this is the reason why some folks want to rush through this, so that you can't really get down and knowing what's what. And when you start reading this paper and getting into it, it gives you a general idea about the general health of a department and how many employees it's got uh, and the services that it's actually rendering to the people. But not to have, and I would, I would you know, think that we should talk about this, Mr. Chairman, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of new rules, policies, and new processes. Uh, I would like to see in our budget the true snapshot of what we got. Even though we're not approving those funds, but there should be inserts that talk about these are additional funds coming into the department and this is how those funds are being expenditured. That is super important. Here's why that's so important because now that we're on the subject matter of the $669,000 in grants that we receive, uh, of that, um, the director says there's 280,000 is actually in the shop chore administration agent. So it tells me that 280,000 of that grant is being utilized lies in administration in terms of administering fees. Is that correct? It's not going to an actual program, it's in a sense, but it's it's going to pay your payroll. Is that correct? Chair, or excuse me, director? The, uh, to the councilman, the 280,000 pays for nine staff in the Department of Aging who are out cutting grass, raking leaves, uh, processing applications. So it is for uh, staff but that's essentially what the program is. It requires, you know, the staff are out on the street in city cars doing these jobs. So, so, then, so then those same employees, because in that, in that, so when we're looking at this, if we're not really paying attention, we won't know. So now the next question would be, Mr. Chairman, to the director, when we're looking at just in our general fund dollars, are some of those same employees being paid out of the general fund dollars that we have here? Director, uh, through the chair to the uh, to the councilman. No, these those are separate employees. You know, we know their 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 payroll is attached to either grant dollars or general fund dollars. So I have uh, fourteen staff covered by grant dollars. I will comment that all of the money that we get from the Ohio Department of Aging, I do come before council 
each each year to be able to ask, you know, we know these dollars are going to be coming and that's part of the legislation, the authority to accept it. And so while we don't know the exact dollar amount, it usually is in about the $400,000. So each fall, you, you see me at the table um, talking mm -hmm. about these very stable funds, which we're so grateful for because it allows us to employ people long term in the department. So where where is the other $389,000 spent? Through the um, chair to the councilman, the 389,000 is um, other staff, um, all staff dollars. So the services I mentioned of our aging and disability resource center, all of those staff are covered by grant dollars. Also anyone who's doing HEAP outreach, uh, Medicare savings application assistance, supportive services. We have one employee on grant dollars for that. So. These are programs that um, are pretty uniform across the state in different departments of aging. And so I told you their specific title that I would call them here. But, you know, if you were to look at um, the job classifications, many of them, uh, one of them is a geriatric outreach worker. There is um, aging services administrators. So if you were to come into our office, you wouldn't know who's paid by grant dollars or general fund dollars. You know, it's one service we provide. It's just different requirements um, for reporting and receiving these grant dollars that we have. So- You mean, the, Director, not everyone wears a different color t-shirt based on how they're funded? Yeah. Um, Councilman, go ahead. <laughs> do, do you have, Mr. Chairman, to the director, do you have some of your employees uh, probably paid by the general fund in addition to Black grant, do you have a you know a commingle of payment going to any of your employees? Is it or is it one of those situations is either or? Director, um, I'm gonna uh, I'll speak and then Adam, if I say this um, incorrectly, I believe every employee is associated with either general fund or grant dollars. There's no mixing of funds. Would that be correct, Adam? Through the chair to the councilman, that'd be correct. We. We work to keep those um, piles of money uh, uh, clean in that way. Thank and, you, Councilman. And, and Mr. Chairman, to the director, um, normally every year you give us, I, I, so I presume that the, the budget that we're looking in front of us right now, I think that's 1.6 million. All of that is in administrative fees. All that's used for administrative fees, is that correct? Councilman, question being for staffing or? We have 18 employees in the Department of Aging. So right. all of what we're looking at right now, it, this is covering um, those expenses. Is that correct? That's my understanding, Councilman. Director? Yeah, um, this budget, $1.24 million covers the actual staff cost. There are other expenses in the Department of Aging for those 18 general fund employees. And, and then so there's these, 14 not included in this. Right. So so this is just so all together, how many employees do you have with because you, you gave us a number, but I want to make sure that I was hearing it right from the budget hearings, uh, the black grant hearings now. So how many staff members do you currently have working for you? Through the chair to the councilman, I have 18 general fund and 14 grants, so 32 employees um, that are um, part of the Department of Aging team currently. And, and Director, and, Councilman on that point, Director, the you say 14 grant that includes CDBG, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Councilman. And so so I guess, are we down, um, are we down five people or six people? Through the chair to the director, I mean, to the, um, I keep saying that today, my apologies, but to the councilman, um, we are, um, this budget reflects uh, four less employees um, in, in the budget. And then we are currently filling two positions in the Department of Aging. So six is the correct number if you're looking from previous years. And, and, and Mr. Chairman, um, to the director, um, if you could be so kind to give me the, the, the people who, um, you know, their, their names and phone numbers and what programs they actually, like a cheat sheet 
that they actually are over so that, you know, uh, the new volunteers that we have coming in that are filling the calls for our senior citizens, they'll know exactly who to call for what the issues are. And, and you have a number of programs that you have currently out and moving. Now, I guess the, the, what we looked at in terms of the block grant, uh, does that cover all of the available programs uh, that, that we see that you, your department administers, or is there any other programs that, that this may not have captured? Director. Um, I, I need some clarification, Councilman Jones. When you say block grant, you're asking about block grant or general fund? Well, what I'm asking is that in the general fund, right? So when we're looking over here at the general fund dollars, um, the general fund dollars seem to do like the senior home assistance program, various senior initiatives, um, disability day awareness. Some of that is not over here in the, the black grant, but some of it is all, some of the, the, the black grant stuff is over here on this page. So I guess what I'm saying is, is with the with what you have given us in, in the budget process of black grants, is there is there anything that's that that a set of programs that we may not have in terms of performance? Because I don't see any performance documentation. We looked in the in, in the Dropbox to see if there was any presentations for the Department of Aging today or any other kind of paperwork. But were there some kind of presentations of paperwork we should have gotten? Uh, to the to the councilman, I provided my overview of numbers we had served in my opening comments. I can provide them in a in a written format if you'd like. Um, I think a key figure to take away is um, the department as a whole, with one of our core programs, served seven thousand one hundred and twenty four unduplicated clients in uh, twenty twenty, which is a number higher than we've ever served in the twelve years I've been here. And I think okay. that really speaks to the pandemic and the more older adults reaching out to us that we hadn't met before. But I can provide um, my um, highlights in a narrative format um, to Ms. Tilly. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, can we also, if Ms. Tilly could get this information too, uh, I would like to request a breakdown of the population uh, uh, in, the, in the wards in terms of senior citizens. Uh, which neighborhood has the has a growing, you know, up and coming growing population of seniors? Uh, which uh, neighborhood has the less seniors? That would that would give me a, a general ideal. Um, I, I've always said that War One is one of our largest senior populations, but I'm not so sure now. Is are we do we still have the lead? Uh, Director, do you have the information on, uh, or could you get the compile the information on where our seniors are? I can. Um, that is some new American Community Survey data that we can pull and um, share with Ms. Tilly. Thank you. So if you could provide those two requests from the councilman to Ms. Tilly. Thank you. And, and then um, if and once you've gotten other information on who does what in your departments, that'd be great. And so, Mr. Chairman, um, to the director, I do. I have noticed, you know, a lot of people call me about um, uh, shoveling snow because a lot of our senior citizens are concerned with that. Uh, how many people uh, do we have uh, in the Department of Aging that's actually performing that service? Through the chair to the councilman, um, that right now in the Department of Aging, um, we have our chore team, which is out shoveling pathways, which I think is really important to say, we do not do whole driveway shoveling. I wish we could, but we don't have that capacity. And what we do is provide pathways so a meal could be delivered, someone could get out and get on a transportation vehicle. But really so much of our snow shoveling work comes through court community services. So um, Paul Cloder and his team have teams out there every day um, shoveling pathways for seniors. Um, but the need is, I will say is greater than um, either the Department of Aging or court community services could provide after the snow we've just had. And so, so, so um, we've got about a thousand people on the snow path shoveling program, Councilman, and we are working through that list um, to, to help people out. And, and here, here's my thing, Mr. Chairman, to the director. We shouldn't bite off more than we can chew. And so I've always been a person that believes that we shouldn't bite off more than we can chew. Um, and that's the reason why I specifically ask what's our capacity? Who's doing what, right? 
So well, I know that um, unfortunately the, the, the city has been throwing out tickets um, left and right. Uh, police tickets are being thrown out. Uh, every ticket on the planet that, that um, the, our, our people are writing out here is actually being tossed in the courts. So that means that Paul Cloder is not gonna have the manpower he needs um, to really run his program. So the question is how many people in your staff is actually doing that, right? And then, and, and really truly, what is a real snapshot of capacity of Mr. Cloder doing this? Director? Uh, to, to the councilman, the current Department of Aging staff, we are budgeted um, with, uh, Jeremiah Great House oversees the program. Then we have uh, three permanent employees and then we hire two to three seasonals. Our really um, premier program in the chore program is the grass cutting program. And so that's really, uh, we bring on those employees. Um, levels of teams with Paul Cloder, you know, you, we have a contract with them that comes out of the line item that is um, uh, contractual services. So we have a contract with them every year. I wouldn't know how many teams are out today, but I do know that he does need more people power. Um, right. So, so, so if we, if you could get that information, cause I don't, you know, I, I was told there was two people out there doing all this show. And, um, and I said, it's no way in the world, two people are going to get, you know, out here. I feel sorry for them uh, that they they're shoveling this snow like this and it's just two people. And then you add Paul Cloder, maybe six. Uh, if you're lucky. Um, so I don't, that's the reason why I asked you what the capacity was. And, and it's not to make it to be a situation for you. Uh, it's just a situation for the council, knowing that we have to put a program that's in place so that when citizens are signed up on these applications to get their snow removed, they're not beating the crap out of me in the process saying, hey, you're my councilman. You, you're supposed to, you know, we have a large senior population. And I'll tell you, um, Mr. Chairman, to the director, they're, they're very demanding. Uh, they're one of the last great fighting generations of people. And they, and they will get upset and throw me up under the bus lickety split. So, so when I'm having these issues and I'm trying to get in contact with someone, um, I, I don't want to you know, uh, catch a heart attack because I'm, my stress levels are being raised because I can't get someone out there fast enough to, to serve them. So, so for me, what I tell a lot of our senior citizens is that we, you know, the, you know, I had some complaints this morning. So I told them, I says, right now the department has their hands full. So, you know, and they're not going to, some of them feel that you're going to plow their whole drive. And I tell them, no, they're not doing that. They're only going to plow a path for you and do this. So some of them just don't know the parameters of the program. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, having to feel those kinds of issues. So that I think that this is a program that we should, you know, come back and take a look at. And and Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that you know you know we come back and, and look at some other programs in terms of the reconciliation, uh, where we know the needs are for our neighborhoods. One of those is landscaping. Um, you know, so how much money do we spend uh, on landscaping, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the director on an annual basis in the city of Cleveland? Director. To the councilman, that grant, um, CDBG dollars um, pay for um, our own internal chore program. We also then under contractual services put out to bid um, about $40,000 worth of work to help us with grass cutting. Um, and so it's a mixture. And then we have that contract with court community or court community services. So we really have three. Um, so what's that 190,000 um, with our contracts. And then of that 280,000 CDBG that's used, the, the bulk of that, those dollars are in our chore program. There's only one staff person that is not um, on the chore program is working on uh, the SHAP program. And, and Mr. Chairman, let me just, you know, $40,000, you know, is really not a lot of money at all. And so I would ask is the, the you're just talking about the allocated for clarification, Mr. Chairman, to the director, you're just talking about the allocated dollars that you work, you're not talking about the other monies that maybe other elected officials give to the department. Is that correct? Correct. 
So what's your total budget overall for grass cutting in the city that you have that you that you're working with? Yeah, to the councilman that those dollars that we contract with a total 90,000. So between court community services and what we put out to bid, and then we hire city of Cleveland's employees who are seasonal to assist us in the summer. And I will tell um, members of the council, the application for the new grass cutting program uh, was mailed out yesterday to all of right. the requested it. So that program begins in May. We believe we have the capacity. We know the number we can accept to be able to reach that need. Last year, we were able to serve all of the applicants who applied. Um, and, um, you know, if that comes to a point where we're not able to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll become aware of that. But at this point, between what our Department of Aging employees, you see them in trucks, they're out with mowers, um, out in the ward starting, you know, ideally the last week of April with the grass cutting program, and then it goes through um, October. It's one cut per month. So the word landscaping would be a stretch. You know, we're really trying to prevent people from getting tickets from the health department um, for it. So we know many people supplement what we provide by hiring a, someone from their church, a young person on the street. We know that is um, often needed because this is one cut per month. But Mr. Chairman, to the director, this is something that, you know, is near to my heart. Um, you know, we started our program, we had a, a rocky start, and then uh, we went in and changed the parameters. Um, 90000 is really not a lot of money. Um, and of the one cuts that you give, how many customers with that one cut do we reach in the city Correct. as a whole? How many? Um, we cut just over a thousand yards a month. And um, with both that contract and then councilman, I would just want to be sure you remember that we got a team of, you know, full time in, in, in the summer um, and, you know, 35 hour a week employees also cutting for the Department of Aging. So I would say it's probably closer to 230,000 of the CDBG dollars are used to operate our chore program. So we're really looking at what I would say is, um, 320,000 um, to operate our grass cutting program. Okay, and Councilman, just as a note, we're at 25 minutes on your line of questioning. So I've got a couple of council members coming up behind you. They're waiting in line for the bathroom. So, right. um, so well, one, thing, me, I'll wrap it up. one thing I will say is uh, for the Health and Human Services Committee, we have been really focused on COVID uh, from the beginning of the year to now, which I think was been appropriate. We will most definitely after budget, um, take deeper dives with our hearings into aging, into HHS, or into, excuse me, into the health department. Um, so just to put a pin in that, we will be um, providing additional opportunities. Go ahead, Councilman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the additional time, and I'll, I'll wrap it up. The, the, the 90,000 or the 320,000, is there somewhere you can show me where that's at, at, in the in the city? That was one of the reasons why we were talking about this and and black grant hearings. We knew that we would have we would hope to have had more time to really talk about some of these items because we, we didn't really get into it in the actual black grant hearings on the various different programs. So the the question would be three hundred twenty thousand. Is that reflective in our black grant budget somewhere, director? Yes, uh, to the councilman. Yes, that's in the 280,000 SHAP chore administration on the CDBG, if you decided that's page 3-1. Okay, so that's labor then. That's pays for your, that is a part of your labor. Those are people, that's what I said. It's nine okay. staff people. That, those are okay. critical members of the Department of Aging team that are doing this work every day. Well, with that being said, I think that you're doing a great job. I really appreciate the fact, I like our relationship and I want to look to try to increase our programs over the years. I think we need more money into the programs um, so that we can really provide a quality service. And um, and uh, Mr. Chairman, to the director, I appreciate you getting those applications out there. Um, and I've already told my seniors to start, um, you know, signing up for them and turning them back in really quickly. Um, and so hopefully the same group that we've had, maybe some additional more 
uh, we'll be able to service them uh, this this season. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the director, thank you for your service, your commitment, and your dedication to our senior citizens uh, in the city of Cleveland. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Councilman Blaine Griffin, you're up. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Ms. McNamara as well. She is um, a great director. I was privileged to work with her, her former um, um, director, Jane Fumich, and Jane trained her well. Jane basically did a great job and is a, is a testimony of uh, really trying to do a great succession plan. So really appreciate that because she had big shoes to fill and she's filled them well. Um, the one thing that I would uh, really ask is really looking at the budget. And, and I know that Councilman McCormick, I had to step away and I think he asked this earlier and I know Director Dumas mentioned it earlier, but contractual is 97,000. Does that include transportation or what else is included? Because I know that you and I met with a few groups because my question is around transportation, but what does contractual include? Director? Yes, uh, through the chair to the councilman, that item contractual is our bed bug contract. And so the transportation okay. contract, um, I will tell you is in the community development um, budget under director Walker's. Okay, cause they asked me to defer to aging and it's the reason that I was asking that, but I'll just talk to director Walker's offline. And I know that you and I, and um, this would be direct, I mean, this would be, uh, I gave you a, a promotion, uh, Councilman McCormick. This is Councilman McCormick's issue since he's the chair now, but I wanna make sure that I follow up that. I know that our costs were starting to go up with transportation and that's a critical need as well. Have we been able to re-engage that group and look and see what we might be able to do because their costs and their proposal looked like it was increasing significantly? Yes, uh, through the chair to the councilman. So that contract is with Senior Transportation Connection. So they're a 15 year old nonprofit. So that is an, an ongoing issue around efficiencies and miles distance. But um, this year they were able to provide uh, more than 11,000 trips to Cleveland seniors. So I, I believe some dollars were left on the books because seniors weren't utilizing that service. But um, they are continuing to be pretty innovative on in how they can uh, lower their costs. Okay. All right. The other thing that I'm asking is you don't have a grant writer. And I tell people I used to hate grants coming from the nonprofit arena when I worked in the nonprofit arena, but I'm starting to get excited about the Biden administration as well as some other things. And I believe we need to be shovel ready for grants. Who writes the grants for your department? And where's that reflected in your budget? Yeah. That, yes. Thank you, uh, Chair. We do have a grants administrator. And so that position um, is um, partly responsible for it, but um, Adam and I do the bulk of the grant writing. Um, and these are, in, in many cases, the grants we receive are ones that um, we have been become very familiar with, but we did add two years ago, a grant administrator, which has been very helpful to our department to be able to, to help us with reporting of each of these grants. Okay, great, because I've been getting a lot of calls from the state delegation, really encouraging us to try to go after more grants regarding, um, you know, everything from housing to public safety to senior and direct service and everything. So um, I just want to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to go after some of these grants that they say are sitting there and we're not tapping into. Um, and I'll have a conversation with them as we go on. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I did want to um, do it, and Director, I don't know if this is in there, but um, I'm looking for kind of, do you have an ombudsman? I know that I call you and you jump right on it, um, but who really handles your high rise apartments. One of the biggest complaints that I have and one of the biggest frustrations that I have is that you have a lot of buildings where seniors are the primary tenants, whether they're subsidized housing or apartments, or if they're just um, regular um, apartments that seniors have been living in a long time. And, and we're running into these landlords that are, are really treating these folks substa in substandard conditions. Um, who is our point person in the department other than you that is budgeted to do that? Or should we budget somebody to really work closely with these state facilities or these state entities 
or building and housing to make sure that we have rigorous protection um, for the seniors, especially since um, the rental, uh, what is it called? The, uh, the group that used to do tenant land, the, the Cleveland Tenants mm -hmm. Organization, because yeah. we don't have groups like that. Do we have anybody that we partner with or what do we have in our budget that can reflect how we can deploy somebody to deal with these issues around senior housing that seem to continue to um, plague us in the city? Director? Yes, uh, uh, through the chair to the councilman, I think there's really three areas. If we're thinking just senior buildings, so this is independent apartments, 98 of them in the city, that um, I would say a, a key place if you're seeing structural issues that are not being addressed, heat, I think making a referral to the mayor's senior initiative. And so in the Department of Aging, that's Ron Bridges um, on the Department of Aging team, who then works closely with building and housing and health to be able to address um, you know, what's going on in the building. If it's a care facility, so someone who's not living independently, but is living in an assisted living facility, a group home, a um, nursing home, I know the situation you and I just talked about, um, I would say that um, situation, you'd wanna make sure you know who the long-term care ombudsman is. And so that's a service um, and I can get their contact information to Ms. Tilly. Um, that's a critical resource in our uh, community. I can remember about four or five years ago, we had the head of the long-term care ombudsman come to a health and human services committee meeting to be able to help us all understand the role they play in being an advocate for residents. Um, and then I, the third person I would say, if it's, a, if, it's, if it's an issue in a high rise where you think people are being mistreated, it's not a, it's not a structural issue, but it's perhaps neglect or um, maybe residents are feeling um, not heard by their building and these are independent dwellers, I, my recommendation would be to make that referral on my team to Shaniqua Caffey. She's our administrative manager over social services. And then we have a whole breadth of folks underneath her who um, make contact with that senior. You know, we've got someone who works on homelessness prevention. But um, so I, Shaniqua would be internally, I think a good uh, point person for you for overall questions about senior well-being. but Ron Bridges. And I think this gets to uh, Councilman Jones question. I can get a call list for you guys to know who these people are in our department and how you can reach them. That'd be great. Cause I know that a lot of us just pick up the phone and call you and, you know, being a former director, I can tell folks that you got staff, you do have a team of people that, you know, sometimes um, the director is very busy and we should have our assistance, even if it's not us to be able to have our um, EAs to be able to have numbers of who they can navigate. Cause those two people you just named, I didn't know they existed. And to be honest with you, um, their numbers will get burned up now because it will be people calling them on a regular basis, um, you know, from my office for help for seniors because we just need help with seniors. Last but not least, and I don't see this in the budget, but it's something that I would like for us to look at. And this is probably a discussion we probably should have had earlier in the year. But um, one thing COVID revealed to me is that seniors need um, broadband and electronic access to. And I'm not sure, I know Council President and myself are very active in uh, the Broadband Coalition and other groups, but the point that I'm trying to get is I think that we need to start playing a role in facilitating partnerships and really getting involved in the broadband space. Um, even if it's for doctor's appointments, for safety, for other things, and not saying that the city should go and provide all of those tools to people, but I, I do think that we should have senior friendly digital networks. I, I love your call system. I think that is beautiful, but more and more seniors are starting to get on Facebook. Um, I tell people that's the, the venue for old folks like myself now. Um, that's where we actually communicate with a lot of seniors because they're starting to get on Facebook. So I see you got money in here for print. But have you thought about putting a budget together or, or money in here to have a digital footprint and trying to find ways to reach out to seniors digitally, even if it's about classes or anything to really get them um, up to speed with the 21st century? Because I don't want too many seniors getting left behind because technology is moving at a rapid pace. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you to the, uh, through the chair, to the councilman, you've really touched on something that's so I'm really passionate about. Um, I'm the co-chair of the digital equity coalition with the Cleveland foundation, their digital equity group with Wanda Davis is the other co-chair at Ashbury uh, community senior center. I saw one role we play in addition to convening people because I think that's an important role for the Department of Aging in the city to be able to convene partners and bring together those senior centers, senior buildings. But we, we did see a need to create a technology resource guide that really in one document helps seniors know where do I go first to get a device, you know, PCs for people, RET, um, where do I go to get affordable Wi-Fi, digital C, um, you know, am I going through um, the Lifeline program, a new state, a new federal program that's going to come out that's going to give a, a $50 credit. And then the third part is where do I go to get the skills? So there's players in town who do that. So we, as part of the age-friendly work, created this guide. We've now printed, our, our print budget's pretty hefty because that's how we get out a lot of things. So we printed 10,000 of these 24 page guides and give them out as often as we can because we know if someone's not connected to technology, they're not gonna find it online. We need to hand them something that makes it easy to take that first step towards it. What we did use some of our robocalls this year to do, which Councilman, I was really pleased. We just, we made some targeted robocalls to seniors, particularly around Ashbury or where Digital C was expanding and told them about the new program and asked them to call back in the Department of Aging and Department of Aging staff would help them understand even just like what is digital C or PCs for people. So I do think aging has a role in the Department of Aging in helping convene it. From a, from a budget item, I'm not sure of our specific role in um, what you would see as you know, a budget item because I think this is part of what we do every day which is just information and assistance and tying together the network for it. But I'd love to get you that technology guide if you don't have it. And would love to get you a thousand copies for you to hand out to people because the work an organization like PCs for People is doing can be that first step for people. But we know they need help with application, completing the application to get the free device. So. And, you know, I would love to have those thousand copies, but I will tell you that um, with zero degrees weather and COVID, uh, the Ward 6 team is not hitting any doors this weekend. So take your time. Okay? All right, all right. Uh, but what I will tell you is that when I look at opportunities, I do think that we do have a role, even though I know we should always partner with external agencies, that it should not always be the role of government. But I do think that um, we should have some kind of role. The one thing I would like to, um, and, and I'm going to say this because he's not here. I thought Councilman Conwell had a brilliant idea and it's something that I think we should do. It was around your robocalls, but when uh, the apocalypse hit last year in March of 2020, one of the things I was really concerned about was a lot of seniors that um, you know, were stranded in their homes by themselves and didn't have a lot of, of, of support with the outside world. And Councilman Conwell came up with a great concept that it should be some kind of card or some kind of distress card or some kind of way that we should notify that seniors should be able to notify if they're in distress. Um, I think he had a way that you could turn the card inside out if you had a senior in distress or something like that. It should be either red on one side or green on the other side. So when police ride by that, you know, they can't stop and do wellness checks at every house, but they could at least see that senior is okay or something like that. I don't know if that's something you've thought about or what is best practice, but I would love to see if you can engage that in your budget with printing that all of us can be, could use that as a universal symbol for um, the police department to recognize when seniors are in distress or not. Um, and I'm not sure if there's legal things around that, but it's something that I would like to pitch to you in Councilman Conwell's absence, because I do think that we, like Councilman Polinsic said, we have to do a better job of trying to be shepherds for our elderly. Many of them are living in homes isolated by themselves, tough conditions, and their only connection with the outside world is, is their council person. Unfortunately, um, well, not unfortunately, I actually find myself sometimes going out trying to shovel some of them out myself. 
Um, and for all the 25,000 residents of Ward 6, don't get any bright ideas. It's very rare that this old man gets out and does it. But um, I have been in emergency situations where people have had to go to the doctor or something. And, and I just think that we need to have some way of really trying to shepherd and show when seniors are in distress. So just a thought, if you could think about that and we could kick that around some more. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Director McNamara. You're doing a great job. Ultiman, you hit right on your 15 minute mark. You're good. Um, all right. So seeing no other hands, Director, thank you again to, to, your, to you, your leadership and your staff uh, for the really nimble work they've done, especially during COVID, um, you know, to, to support our seniors. And we look forward to continuing this conversation about how to enhance some of the services in your department from a, you know, not only from a funding perspective, but a capacity perspective. I think that's been a loud and clear call from the members of city council. So thank you, director, uh, for the good work that you do. Uh, to the administration and council, we are gonna take a 20 minute break. We're gonna take a 20 minute break. Um, am I muted? I'm sorry, here we go. We're gonna take a 20 minute break before we go into the health department. So to the folks from the health department, 20 minute break, which gets us to 120. We will reconvene this at one. 20, 120, in which we will hear the Cleveland Department of Public Health. So until then, we'll see you in 20 minutes. Thank you.